great. All right, friends, we are back with another episode of the Strong Life Podcast. Super special guest, Coach Alvermeil, who I've been trying to get on the podcast, trying to figure out a way to contact you, Coach, for a long time. And I contacted you through um, Derek Hansen's website. Oh, yeah. He's, Derek's an outstanding coach up in Vancouver. Correct. And so I don't even know if you have your own website. I was kind of went. No, through I don't. Right now, I don't have anything. I have. Good for you. <laughs> well, no, I have thought about as a small business yeah. of doing Zoomcast on a limited basis, but entirely different. It would be a simple term. A top, the title would be Ask Al. In other words, I would do 10 to 12 coaches. They would submit their questions beforehand to me. If I felt I could answer them sufficiently, then we'd go through the financial part, set it up, and I'd spend a couple hours with them because I don't want to do a presentation. I want to do something with their what what are their your high school coach? You yeah. you in a private, you may have a different set of problems uh, and a different needs than the guy. You your level, level, level of knowledge may be here where someone else isn't, or they're a better said their experience they right. for example they might want to say well speed training's a new rage well okay it's not new <laughs> you know and like i tell people when i first started coaching we used to say in football if you couldn't run you couldn't play because all those coaches came out of the ear when you played both ways and i played both ways all the way until i was in, in a four-year school i played both ways even for my brother dick and napa jc and that's uh and unfortunately for the modern strength coach, we might as well start there. And I don't want to say modern. That's a poor choice of words. But I think the emphasis has been so much. I was talking to Carl, Carl Ballet today about this yes. and others. There's been so, and, uh, and uh, oh my, Brian Reynolds, at the chief. There's been so much emphasis. Oh, are they recovered? Oh, this is a good one. Are you getting tired enough to recover? <clears throat> yeah. You're going to get pulled hamstrings if you don't sprint enough. But to do that, you've got to have a strength reserve and a power reserve. So in other words, you've got to have some strength yeah. and you've got to have some power. Right. Because if you're only relying on the tendons and ligaments, you're going to get all kinds of problems as your propulsion mechanism. I mean, obviously having great elasticity or reactivity is super, but you better put some strength and power for durability, not, not only in the season to play. And and if people listening to this are going to say, Jesus, you sound like a broken record, because I usually come up with the same thing. When I played college football, which is a long time ago, I would run 36,000 yards of wind sprints in the summer. I'd start with 10 50s. 50 was the 40 was just starting to come in. Uh, and so I would work up and add one or two a week. So I figured if you did that five days a week, I figured exactly how many I ran. And I was up to where I'd run 20 a day. Now, were they quality? I'd run one, walk one. And then one year I'd run the first 10 and walk one. Then I'd jog the second 50 and turn around and run it back, which was really stupid, but didn't know better. But was I in condition? Could I tolerate work? Exactly. And I still can tolerate work. Yes. You first got to condition the body to tolerate the right. stress. And there's too much worry. Oh, his maximum velocity went up a point mile an hour. How many times in a game do you use it? Well, it looks great when a guy catches a bomb or breaks a line. or That's great. But what is the percentage of the time you do that? It is very small. Correct. I'd rather have, I'd rather have everybody be able to run 20 yards fast and in great shape. Yeah. You know, so, and I, I just think we've gotten so carried away with that. And in, in, in what's happening in training and I, I don't even like to call it strength and conditioning. Uh, I'm going to bounce around here. And I'm That's sorry. For the I do the same. <laughs> people always said, oh, you micro dogs back in the 80s. No, back in the 60s. We didn't call it micro dogs. Because when I started coaching, we call it the off season program. It wasn't called strength and conditioning. So we did strength, power, speed. We did it, uh, endurance circuits or agility circuits. When plyos came in, we added them. We did a limit, but we didn't say strength and conditioning. And what that does is limit Correct. that word strength. And now they call it performance coach, which is good. But basically, 
you know, everybody, I mean, guys microdosed probably 150 years ago, you know, they're, everybody thinks they've invented things, but, and a lot of people say that because they're on the way on, on their, they're selling things. So they got to have a new DV, DVD or, you know, a new, yes. and this is, this is the 18th division, uh, 18th, uh, what am I trying to update of my training system? <clears throat> Hey, the training system I used at Moreau High School was the same one I used to the 49ers, the same one I used to the Bulls, the same one I used to my private clients. I learned more how people adapted. Yeah. I learned more about the science behind it, but the exercises remain in squats, pulls, presses, Olympic lifts. When I learned the jumps, jumps, speed, we ran up and downhill back in this is in 76, we were running downhill. I got it from a a young man I was a, a grad assistant with named Gibber Romain. He was at, at uh, Maryland and he was working with Randy White and he had gotten it from Frank Costello. And I, I did that, Vince. Uh, I had that original plyometric book <laughs> from yeah. Frank Costello. Yeah, Frank was a good coach. I, he's, he is a good one. He's a good guy. Yes. I haven't talked to him in a hundred years, but uh, <laughs> And then I did a 30-second station I got from Vince Gibson, which is great conditioner, used it with the Bulls. And then we ran, uh, we also did what people call now uh, floating sprints. We called them ins and outs because Vince, his staff, had went to the track coach and found the best way to improve speeds. They ran in and out. What's an and in and out? Ran, like you're fast. You, in other you words, coast. you accelerate, you kind of maintain it or take a little, it depends on your, you ran 15 yards that way, 15 yards in the middle, 15. We just yes. went across the football field. We divided I like it that. in thirds. Yes, but, that's awesome. And they called it floating sprints. And I, I know I'm bouncing around, but what that's I'm okay. saying is, is we encompassed everything. And now the, everything has to have a term today. It's microdosing. It's this. I think if they worried less about the terms and just coached and, you know, and in, in talking about recovery, as, as Carl made a great point today, it's not very hard if they're standing up talking to you, arguing they're working too hard. So if a player looks at, oh, we're working too hard, you're not breathing hard enough to be working too hard. I think we've gotten away from oh, that. We've gotten away, <clears throat> and I know work. the people on, on don't, you can't you can't develop mental toughness. That's uh, you know, it, it's a little bit of a vague term. Correct. But if you gradually expose people to tougher and, and more intense training and volume yes. over time, they will develop the mental ability to tolerate that. Now you, I've seen now, it. And now you can go out there the first day and you know do ridiculous things. You're going to lose some kids who mentally can't, right? Physically, but if you, you know, I saw it at Merle High School. I saw it at Castro Robley High School. I've seen it at every level, but you gradually add it pretty soon they're doing work they never thought they could do. And that's developing a physical toughness or a physical capacity would be a better word. I but should it say. also develops the mind. That, it's that, cool. that, Oh, maybe I can do more. Correct. So the next time you up it now, you can't go <clears throat> crazy. I'm not, I'm not you don't saying, destroy them. you know, the stuff, of, well, the stuff that guys go in the first day and they have that muscle disease. I mean, that's just the dumbest the, I, 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 what are you trying to prove to me coach that says to me you don't even need to be an educated coach to understand that you don't need to destroy people on the it's just common sense but I, I you know i jump around a lot too so we'll probably you know converse just fine you know if we go back to the first part you were talking about coach about um the work just doing work we get so careful and worried is it too much and um by the way uh you know proper intro for you coach you know you started coaching oh you don't have to give me all that stuff just so (laughs) all right i'm gonna i'm gonna let the the listeners actually research your background well you know uh, the thing is basically i was a high school coach for 10 years yes one and one of those during that time uh, after my first year was broken up, I was a graduate assistant at, at Kansas State. I was one of the great gophers of all time. <laughs> I vacuumed the coach's office, picked up his laundry, <laughs> you know, but it was a great education. I didn't appreciate the experience enough. And this is one thing I wanted to just really briefly touch. Because yes. I made a lot of mistakes. You're not looking at a virgin here. So I just want to make that 
very clear. I'm no smarter than anybody else and, and not as smart as some. But what I'm saying, sometimes when you're in a situation that you are not enjoying as much as you should, it's because you lose sight of your purpose while you're there. I lost a little bit of my sight. I should have paid a little more. I learned a lot, but I should have paid more. And there were other jobs I took. Sometimes I get frustrated and I allowed my frustrations to uh, cloud my judgment Yes, I've and, and focus. And so young coaches, it, no job's perfect. Just remember, oh, I don't like this job. Well, two things. You're going to take your shortcomings to the next job and the next job is going to have a different set of problems than the one you have. Agreed. And when you find a perfect one, there will be nobody there because there's only one perfect man, depending on your religious belief, that walked this earth and you saw what they did to him. So there are no perfect people. People all have, uh, I think Mark Twain said this, and if I'm wrong, something like this, people are like the moon. They have a dark side too. We yeah. all have two sides. Agreed. So, so uh, I, one of the things when you're in a situation and you're not feeling positive, look at what you can do to make it positive and what you can get out of it positively and how you can positively impact. I, a 49er player, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this. Charlie Young came to me and Bill Walsh's funeral afterwards and said, you did a lot for me. And I, you know, Charlie, I, I can't remember how much he trained. And I said, gee, Charlie, thank you. He said, every day you came with a smile and you're upbeat and you're always positive. You know, that's, but I watched some coaches walk in the weight room and you think, you think they were, they were going to D-Day and all the players are enemies. Yeah, you know, I, I, I enjoyed the players. <laughs> if you don't, right. I enjoyed the players at <laughs> all the levels. And, and, you, you know, and, and some people think they only have to enjoy the professional. If you don't enjoy it, it doesn't matter what level, get out of it and do something else. I enjoyed my association with the players at all levels. And I also had worked with fire and policemen. I enjoyed. Uh, so I think you have to enjoy that relationship with the people you coach. And yes. if you're not enjoying it, you may want to look at yourself. So this is huge. I also made, I, you know, when I coach high school kids now, I coach, you know, 100 to 200 kids a day at the high school. Then at the private facility could be another 30 to 50. <clears throat> and uh, I remember in high school, I was not the most coachable. So I try to remind myself, oh, you know, John Smith is, you know, he's getting upset when I speak to him. I got to find a different way to um, speak with him. But also what's interesting, Coach, how you mentioned some of these coaches come in and it's like they think we're going to war. I like to describe training as like a weightlifting party. The music's got to be pumping. The kids got to be having fun. You know, I'm not the funniest guy, but I tell a lot of crappy jokes and they laugh at it. <laughs> well, I, 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 think there has to, I think there has to be, I'm not big on pumping that music up so much. They get it too loud. You can't coach. I'm, yes, I'm just old now. True. Coach, I am very old school. My high school football <laughs> players was yes, sir. No, sir. They got a haircut. There was none of that modern crap. You know, it was none of all oh, your feelings. The athletic director. That. At, uh, <laughs> if you ever run into the athletic director at Memphis University played for me, Tommy Bowen, and he could tell you what it was like. And I have another, I've had, I had about I'm not sure how many went full time, but at least 10 kids coach football. And some of them coached at that great Dale LaSalle, the 150 games. I got out of that league just in time because he came in. That would have been, <laughs> I got out when he came in. I, I went to 49ers that when uh, the outstanding coach there, and his name, uh, I, I can't remember, but he was, he's a great coach and a legend. But I had a number of my former players, uh, Terry Edson and, uh, I think, oh God, I'm forgetting Mark Robinson and kids, Pat Hayes. And I have a young man that's an outstanding junior college coach, much better coaching. He's at Fresno city named Tony Cabilia. And I mean, I had other kids, uh, Greg Blandino coached. So, and I'm probably forgetting some, and I always apologize, but, oh, I had the kids at my former school at, uh, at Castle Robley. Mike Dubray, and I'm not sure how many other kids from there, but I think you set the tone. I think you go in with a smile on your face. 
I don't think you can make your off season so like this all the time. It's it's got to be the off season. Yes. Now you get your work done. You're intense when you do it. You make sure they do it right. And the biggest mistake coaches make is don't accept the lack of effort, and especially from your best player. Oh yeah, I'm huge on that. They will respect you more. Coach Brian always said, if you want to get their attention, ex- get the, make sure your best players are your best work. And I think um, uh, Coach if- Saban, who, Coach Saban, who's a great coach, just said he said it's last year was an easy t- team to coach or one of them because his best player was the best worker and everything else. If your best players come in and act like it's a privilege for you to coach them. That's you a common gotta, you, thing now. That well, is a you, just, very... you just make it. A, and I don't know what your situation <clears throat> is. When I was, I never had that problem. I said, it ain't pro ball. They never came in with that attitude. Ah, Today, uh, I feel I, like every team has at least this one oh, guy who needs squats don't work for me. You know, I can't oh, front or I can, he, right? You I know why he doesn't want to do them? He's too damn lazy because they're hard work. They're hard. So <laughs> coach, you know, if we like back up on a few things, you were mentioning like feelings and things like this, like, you know, people get their feelings hurt. Um, one thing that I tell myself and I tell the athletes, you know, I, for the, for a while, I basically always worked for myself. You know, I had a year at Lehigh, a year and a half at Rutgers. I'm two years at this high school, but I always say like, I'm always ready to get fired for doing the right thing. And if I got to be tough on you, to get the point across and make it happen, you know, I'm going to do it. And yesterday I had a conversation with a kid about the way he was eating. And he was so like upset, like I was the enemy. And I said, you want me to bullshit you about it and just let you do it wrong and encourage you to eat shitty food and skip breakfast and skip lunch? Or you want me to tell you the truth about what it takes to get it done? And it's amazing how I grew up as an 80s kid. I was born in 75. So I you know, the coaching through the decades, you see these changes and especially coaches. It's gotten softer. It's gotten much softer. It's much softer. Um, My dad would never have questioned a coach. It was on me. If I had something, then go ahead, go talk to your coach about it. Don't tell me to come and do it. And so it's, you know, I don't know if you're how much consulting you do, but I'd love to hear with you if coaches say, Hey, Coach Vermeil, you know, what, what would you do with this guy? Because you were in well, NFL, Major League, NBA, you know, there was there never a, a, a time. Well, there's always, those... there, there, let's take high school first thing yes. to work up. I was fortunate. I was coaching at the time. You still could coach. And I wouldn't coach any way different today. I'd still grab them by the face mask. And if they didn't, parents didn't like it, go ahead and fire my ass. But you're raising a sissy. Yeah. The biggest problem in this society, and any liberals out there, listen. I'm sorry to offend you. You got to raise men listening. to be. You got to raise men to be masculine. We just had a lady on a train that went 40 uh, 40 minutes, 26 stops or something. It was raped, and people came on and off that train. Where were the men to stand up? If yeah, you where you was know, that? We, uh, it was in the east. I think it was someplace in the east. It was just recently. <clears throat> but my point being, you got to raise men to be men. Yes. Don't rip. Oh, that's why we have testosterone. You can't. Oh, I don't mean you have to be a jerk. Right. But you, you, you got to be able to stand up. You got to be strong. How how about these guys? I I tell you what, I guess it was when Trump got elected. You had crying rooms on college campuses because they were (laughs) up. Come on. It's insane. I mean, first of all, I don't know how much attention we paid to all that in college. We were playing football and about having a good time. I mean, right. And school, school got in a way some part of there, but. Uh, <laughs> well, think about this, I'm coach. S- the, the high school kids today, which this, I don't know. I went to high school 89 to 93. Today, it is not uncommon for a high school kid to be unable to do five or 10 push ups, one push up. Oh, I know. But let's that get back to what crazy. you said handling those kids. Yeah, handling those kids. Yeah. I you know I didn't always put my hands on, but when I point and the, well, one of the last guys I did was that athletic director, Tommy Bowen for missing, we were practicing and he missed the same block in practice that got her and, and, and he missed it in the game. And anyway, my point being is you've, 
you just got to be yourself. You establish a way of doing things and you establish an expectation. Yeah. And the only thing they decide is whether they want to, they want to win or don't, they want to meet those expectations and you make your program demanding enough. And maybe this is the mental part that those guys that don't want to pay the price don't join them. Now, did I lose some kids, some good players? I'm sure I did, but the kids that stuck and stayed understood. And I thought coaching high school sports was more than winning and losing. It was to teach them a dedication, a work ethic and something bigger than self. My philosophy has always been, I'll get to the individual, but they first have to commit to the team. I treated them as all individuals. I, I could tell you, I won't give the name, but I knew a young man would walk by and I'd say, what's wrong? And he said, how'd you know? And then we'd sit and talk. But you first make them in whatever way. You probably can't do it like I did. I understand because guys are out there saying, Jesus, this guy's an old dinosaur. You can't. I understand that. No, our but listeners I'm be, are going to love it. <laughs> but I'm going to be I'm going to be honest. <clears throat> I may be an old dinosaur, but when it's fourth down on the one yard line and you got to knock someone jock off to stop and have a goal line stand. You can't be. Well, my feelings are hurt if he scores. No. I always tell them that they score on you. It's like someone hitting their mother. How do you feel about that? Or your sister? You know, it's got to mean something. And yeah. if your program doesn't demand enough, then losing doesn't mean anything. Coach Lombardi said, the harder you work, the harder it is to surrender. And if you don't demand, and then that doesn't mean stupid stuff like, you know, let's go out and see how many squats you're doing until you, your legs fall off and you got to go to the hospital. But that's, I said, line up on the goal line. I said, I want a line of six and everybody would fall in. I said, I want a three foot split on offense. I didn't say two. I want the running backs four yards deep. And I was more, the things I got more upset with were a lack of effort, which we didn't have much problem or blow an assignment. Physical mistakes are going to happen. And you talked about remembering what it was like when you played. And that's something I had to remind myself. I made some mistakes with kids, misread, misread. And one young man and I have become very close and I misread. He played all four years, but I never quite knew how to take him sometime. Good player, really good player. So you can misread people. And there was another young man I misread and, and I really screwed up one year. And, and what do you I mean by misread? Uh, like you couldn't connect oh, with the kid? I misread his reaction. And what he could contribute to the team, he went on to play at a, a, a Cal State Hayward and had a very successful career. And I, when I saw him, when that team was inducted into the uh, Hall of Fame at Merle High School, uh, he hadn't finished the season because I had gotten on him and, and something happened and he said that was enough. And I really, that was my fault. Now, I didn't do a good job. I should have went and got him, talked to him, and I didn't. And I re recognize those things. So what and, he felt like you coached him too hard and he quit. No, I think, well, it's a long story short. He had an altercation with one of our other players, one of our best players, the best quarterback I ever had. And he, uh, and I chewed him out. And the next day he came to get his shoulder pads and I had inadvertently given them to someone else who had been hurt, was coming back out. And so he didn't show up for practice. And so he, that was the end of it. And that was my fault. And when I saw him 30 something years later, I apologized. I said, I was totally wrong. I said it three times. It re, it bothers me to that state that I made that mistake. Right. So you've, you've got to look at you know, things. So I know I, I, people are listening. I think being demanding is being on time, giving a good effort. That doesn't mean the results will be good every day, but a good effort. If they're on time, they do what you ask them to do, consistency, and make sure your best players do what you ask them to do, because they're looking. They're looking at you. It's and shocking when <clears throat> today, you know, sometimes I see some of these very talented athletes, various sports, they're missing that grit and toughness that you kind of spoke about in the beginning, meaning as soon as they get sore or some bumps and bruises, they want to just be in the trainer's office. And, <laughs> you know, I tell them, you've got a weekend off, go to a chiropractor on a Saturday, do a light circuit on Sunday, show up fresh on Monday. 
And in college, well, you can't skip lifting and go to the well, trainer. Well, here's the problem is kids don't play anymore. What do you mean by that? Oh, outside. Correct. Well, what I mean, and I grew up in a rural community. Street ball. I had, I had two older brothers. My dad would play ball. He was a tough guy. The first time I missed football practice as a freshman, he said, we had a guy broke a collarbone and came out and ran wind sprints all season. Uh, he, I never saw him sick until he got cancer, really. And he, and you talk about feelings. I won't go into all the things he told Dick and I and Stan, but he said, he said one time if my, if my brains were gunpowder and they went off, they wouldn't mush my hair. And he said, I was so dumb, I couldn't pour urine out of a boot with directions on a heel. And he did not use the word urine. Uh, but, you know, so, and if you didn't, you know, you did the job right, or you did it over, and you stayed out there, there was no time limit on work. You didn't get off. If your job that needed to be done the next, by the next day wasn't done at five or six, and you stayed, and I was a terrible mechanic. My brother, Dick, was a full-fledged mechanic by the time he left high school, and that's how we made money going to college, but I was terrible. I, I had, a, and my other brother made his living teaching and then later restoring old racing engines. I had zero ability on this which, which I, your one brother coach Dick. Uh, for the eagles Dick. my friend played yeah. under him who's that john wellborn he was an offensive okay. lineman he was like yeah, late heard. 90s i think no he, no no dick didn't coach eagles he coached oh. him 76 through 82 he he had some sort of experience with your brother though i can't well, remember he may how have he, seen, uh, yeah yeah so i remember the name wellborn but then yeah. dick coached the rams to the super bowl and then the chiefs but the point being, he played for the Chiefs. When did your brother? He went from he Philly to the Chiefs, my buddy. He play, he played, he coached the Chiefs from 01 to 06. He was with your brother with the Chiefs then. And I've heard the names of him. Yeah. But the point being, <clears throat> all, the, all the other kids were raised pretty much the same. Correct. To be tough, society to get the was, job yeah. done. Yeah. Well, society was different. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, agreed. We all walk. If we didn't, you know, our mothers didn't get up in the morning, give us a ride to school if it was raining. We put our raincoats on and walked to school. Yes. And what, what I meant by playing is you'd run down creek beds up and down. You would run in plowed fields. You, you, you jumped out of trees because you would be you'd be playing role playing like you were a pilot in World War II and you got shot down. Well, I realized I jumped out of this olive tree a lot. I didn't realize I was probably jumping down at least three to four feet landing. What's that? That's eccentric. That's plyometrics. That's right. And then you run through the plowed fields. Well, what stability you're getting? You know, you're not laying down doing some plank. You really, right. and, and then you'd play games where you had to crawl under things to hide, climb up trees. Man, we went, <laughs> and we went, we went hunting and we didn't shoot each other. Uh, you know, we, everybody had a gun. We all knew how to fire them. Uh, we'd jump out of swings to see who could go up the highest and jump out. We'd all lie. You know, I, I remember that. You know, yeah. Even a simple thing like a teeter totter. Yeah. You're pushing off your legs. You're doing like a squat jump over and yeah. over. What's interesting is, now that you say this, and I always think back to even my high school, nobody tore an ACL or nobody well, had a rotator cuff tear. No, nope. I'll, I'll give yeah. you one better. I started following Calistoga High School football. I was born in 45, so I was about four. My sister, boyfriend, played on the team. He was the quarterback. I followed it from then until I graduated in 63. I don't remember one knee surgery. There were broken legs, broken hand, broken wrist. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew the kids from St. Lena. They were our arch rival. We unfortunately did but I played, they had a club called Carpies Gang. We played them in baseball and basketball. And they actually got to play football. We didn't have that. But I knew all those kids. And I played against them for four years. Same kids. Again, why? And we wore those long pleats that are supposed to be bad. And we didn't have all those injuries. Now, people would say, well, you're not as fast. Yes, we weren't as big. Yes, but we a lot of us played both ways. So we got fatigued. We right. played on grass, but the whole shoe didn't grab the ground. Today, you get on that turf and you got that turf shoe and it stops this way. Yeah. You watching grass. If you go back to the second Super Bowl, I believe Herb Adderley 
intercepts a pass against the Raiders, and you'll see him go down the left sideline, and he makes a cut. And how many steps it takes him to make that cut because he's not on earth. But it's it, all, that, all that play as a kid, and then we all worked. I mean, I worked in my dad's garage. But all that play as a kid, you can't replace if they haven't had it by 14 or 15 because you've developed those neurological pathways, the tendons and the ligaments, the reaction, and you can't you can't make up for what you've missed. And you know, my grandson, I said, "Hey, you, you, you take a bat and ball or a basketball to school when he's nailing me." Oh no, we can't do that. I said, "What? That's crazy." Well, you know, because someone you know, you got all those ambulance chasers out there. We played baseball all the time. We played football. Yes. We showed up and, to school uh, early. Yeah, football. yeah, we did all everybody did so those things, coach, are, are there so they will never come back. And so no. you know, this is why strength and conditioning, I think, is getting very big at the high school level. That's becoming a bigger, yeah. you know, essentially well, it's a more it, it, it's a, a more it's a more <clears throat> it's a more important role. Uh, it's kind of like in some school districts, unfortunately, kids don't have enough to eat. They have to provide right. breakfast. And Correct. I feel very sorry for no, you no young person should start life that way. Unfortunately, it happens. And some of them can uh, ma- overcome them, and it's very difficult. Well, you're having to do the same thing with strength and condition because we don't let them play. You know, we want them to, for the worst thing is to sit boys for down for a long period of time. It's been proven if if they go out and play and burn off, they're going to pay more attention coming in. Yeah. You know, but they 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 try to treat boys. They they don't want to understand the difference between males and females. That's a problem. You know, we we have uh we do not have as a how to, how to say this. We don't have as much of a male dominated social. In other words, my father was the head of the house. What he said went right period and and you knew who was boss my mom was the one that gave us the attention and he was the discipline now he gave us attention he came to our games but you didn't mess with him and it was pretty much the same for all my friends and uh you know i I think cultures just changed and i i don't think you're going to get it back no so you've got to artificially uh you won't get it back unless times get real tough we need great elementary physical educators at the middle school level the physical culture needs to be incorporated and really physical educators are not really knowledgeable about strength and conditioning sports well, performance well, physical you know culture. i, I don't, don't want really to i don't want to lump it. i don't want to lump all coaches into one but uh you know one of the things my parents were married during the great depression my dad wrote, voted for roosevelt the first time not the second time, but the first time. And uh, he said, things didn't change. <laughs> That's why he didn't vote for me. But they raised kids in the Great Depression. My father in law was a uh, young man in the Great Depression. People, Tex winners talked about going, they went through the tough times. So tough times breeds tough people. Interesting. You mentioned uh, well, Teddy Roosevelt with those, the man in the well, arena and well, all that. Well, man, I'm talking about FDR and that election. My dad did Roosevelt. He wasn't born when Teddy was president. But my point being, look, look at America from the standpoint of when they crossed this country in a covered wagon or a pole wagon or walked six months. Was there any guaranteed life insurance? Was there guaranteed of a home or a job when you got to work? No. The only thing was guaranteed the hope you survived. You had famine, disease, uh, tough time. How much, and you've had to deal with you had to deal with uh, uh, the criminal, and you had to deal with sometimes if you if the Indians were you know if you were approaching There's on their always land. a threat, and the weather. At you. The weather, the people. Yeah, you did. You, here I go, my cell phone. Oh, I'll look at. Uh, whatever the thing on my cell phone is right <laughs> and uh, and and tell you the weather no they didn't know a tornado was coming they didn't know you know what was happening and when there was a disaster they couldn't get on and okay we'll fly in the, uh, the national guard and all that and help you through so you think of the people that went through it. then the people that came as immigrants when they came here legally and what they went through there was no press two for another language 
you yeah. learn to speak English. So it's a culture and you can't replicate that. That's uh, why we're never going to go back unless, right. unless we, you know, then you had World War II. It was a matter of survival. And then you also had, uh, you know, if we, then we start looking into the late sixties, seventies drafts, like boys were knowing that there's a great possibility of them getting drafted. So yeah, they well, were. Yeah. So it's a whole different thing. And a I'm threat. sure your listeners are, your listeners are telling me, are looking and saying, Jesus, for me, will get off your soapbox. I, <laughs> I apologize to you. That's but I think, this, I think if you understand why the culture is different today. Yeah. But then my brother Dick was able still to get across what he needed to get across. Why? What did he they, share with you that he felt? Well, first of all, he, what's the, he, he said what he mean and he mean what he said. Mm -hmm. This is the way it was done. And he, he knew how to communicate. And what he did is build trust. The first thing you've got to do is build trust with these kids. And trust comes from being competent, being real, and don't try to be someone else. I mean, there's been, I'm going to say this, there's been coaches out there that did a better job of coaching than I ever did in high school and did it an entirely different way. With Why? Why they, do you think they did better? Well, I, I just, I always feel that, uh, let's put it this way. I took a test online and I was 30 for 30. And they said, you're a perfectionist because you had to look at these graphs and tell which one was wrong. They said, the only purpose, only problem with that, you're never going to be satisfied. So I can only go back and look at the games that I had a real direct effect and that caused a negative result. And that bothers the hell out of me because those young men trusted me. I had built, and, you know, people say, well, you, you, you know, can't, you know, uh, people say you can't expect perfection. If you don't expect profession, perfection, then what the hell are you expecting? I'm very much like that. Uh, this high and I, standard. And, and, and the last one <clears throat> just drives me crazy because I had the right game plan and didn't follow I now here's another thing coaches should understand, and I'm very guilty of it. Your strengths can become your weakness. I was a very intense guy. I got too intense during this game before, should have approached it in a different manner, and I would have been fine. But I got too intense, lost sight of what I was doing, and just did a terrible job. And there were a couple other games uh, during I, I guess. Game. What about during a practice, Coach? Do you ever feel like, because I've been there before, and then I tell the guys, <clears throat> I'm tough on you because I love you. The opposite end of the spectrum is I ignore you or I let you slack and half-ass it. No, you the ever... first, the first, no, the first one's that, <clears throat> I mean, the way you go about it. And I just, I think, again, <clears throat> in like in, when I were being your high school coach, and the thing that when I was in high school, it, the kids enjoyed coming. We worked hard. Yes. We had music. I, I, of course, this is in the 70s. I'd play my old Diana Ross and the Supremes <laughs> and all that. And, and, and the kids would have, would they, they, they'd impersonate me and they'd sneak me behind. And this guy would do an impersonation and I'd step. They were great. You know, I had a, what do you want to say? I think you've got to be human. You've got to laugh at yourself. That's right. If you, yes. Don't, uh, the great Bob Devaney said in one of the first coaching clinics I went to, don't take yourself too seriously because the size of the weather, your funeral, your funeral depends on the size of the weather. And you think about that one for a minute. Say it again, that your funeral depends? The size of the fu your funeral, the number of people that attend depends on the weather. If it's a cold, rainy day, a lot of people are and snowing out, people aren't going to come. <laughs> so don't become too impressed that you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> yes, that's a problem <laughs> today in this. Oh, I, you know, you touched on a little said, bit with coaches it's well they start recruiting <clears throat> kids too soon too they shouldn't be they're recruiting kids oh this kid's a freshman or he's saw him he looks great now you've got kids not wanting to play their senior in high school because they're afraid to get hurt or the coach well, might say and all and with all due respect there was a famous player who plays pro football did that to his college when playing a bowl game and i i always thought that was wrong you're on that team. What if those kids decide in the middle of the season not to block for you? That gave you the ability. Yeah. So that's a whole other story. Those kind of people, I would, I, I don't care if they're the greatest thing, they're the next Jim Thorpe or whoever it is. I don't want them. 
Because yeah, no doubt. They're a cancer and they don't, they, it, it, it's a little bit of the problem with this country. You, you've got to be part of a team first. It's not about you. But the problem today, the culture is all me. Look at me. You know, I mean, now a guy makes a tackle, makes a tackle, a regular tackle, and he's pointing the stands and he's going, I'm number one. I saw a team the other day, a kid raised his hand. I don't know if it's pro or college. They've won about two games and they're going out like he's number one. I had a kid do that one time at JV. They got beat and I chewed his butt out. I, he said, I learned my lesson because they got through. The, the, I, I remember the young individual and he always reminded me, thank you. Know, you don't have to be showboating. You don't have to be showing people. Just play the game. But the trouble, they've got all these celebrations in it all. Hey, just play the. I, I asked a great football player once and i won't name him because he's a hall of famer i didn't have and i called him because i knew i could talk to him he worked for a corporation i watched him play his ball as a boy and i said what would you do if, he said i was watching this team play and i told the guy I said that guy was holding why didn't you hit him in the mouth he said oh we don't do that today he said if one of those guys would have shoved the ball in my face he said we, I would have, you know and i was around some of the old 49ers and they talked about you know and i'm not saying you have to be that but i meant today it's every time guy does something jesus you know like you said even if they have a <clears throat> losing record or they lose they celebrate the <clears throat> every, the individual every, task a, a good friend of mine told me something that was really cool uh, was a wrestling coach at a high school. And he said, in the wrestling room, the only awards on the wall are all the team awards, not the individual state titles, region titles. He says, outside is where the individual <clears throat> stuff is. And to, that was a big focus for me at this school as I felt we had very divided teams. And yeah. I feel yeah, like... Boy. When you're divided, you're crumble when it's tough. So we've been doing a lot of team stuff where well, they here's truly the want to fight for each other. Here's the other thing. <clears throat> if the players that you're dealing with and their team sports coaches isn't, isn't um, enforcing the same kind of demands. Yes or expectations, then it's very hard for you because you've got a contradiction. I always say that the sport and coach that, has more influence than the strength coach. Because you have the time, you, you determine who plays. And yes. when, when I was at Moreau High School, I said that the parents would come, oh, you're doing a great job, coach. How do you get my kids to do things? I said, I only determine two things, who gets a uniform and who, how much they play. The rest of it is up to them. You were a sport and a strength coach in high school, correct? Oh, well, you yeah, I, I handle all my off season. I wasn't going to give turn it over to someone else. Well, back no, I knew it. All. Well, I mean, bad, it's yeah. only today that <clears throat> in. A, oh, no, I wanted to be with those kids. Now, to kind of give you an example, of my off season. I know the coaches are probably disappointed what I'm talking about, but what I did, I had a chart, and I the first thing I would ask, what are your team goals? Who would you vote for captain? Uh -huh. Then what's your individual goals? All right, with this in mind, how many workouts are you going to make in the winter? Now, if the kid was playing another sport, because I never started after school, we'd finish mid-November to Thanksgiving, depending if we were in the playoffs. You didn't have, we only had, I never made it through the first rounds. That's another one of my failures. But you uh, only had two rounds in those days. So the kids would be off until after Christmas. So they went out for other sports. Uh, if they didn't, and I said, let's say we were going to have 40 winter workouts after school, three days a week. How many are you going to make? The only rule was once you set that based on your expectations, if you don't, you don't get it. You don't come out for spring football. So in other words, you don't play in the fall. I did the same thing during spring football. How many workouts are you going to make? Because Dick made a great point to me. It's all right for me to say we want to win, but it's got to start out with they want. Yes. What, they have to have a responsibility. So I made each kid responsible to themselves. It sounds like also, Coach, that you're saying, <clears throat> if you don't, you said you want to do X, Y, Z, and that 
it will require you to make 30 of these workouts. So essentially there is a repercussion for not showing up, which I have often said is you it, just said they have, too. they have to buy in. And, and the gentleman that coached at De La Salle, his name was Lattimore. And he's, he won like 150 straight games. I don't care what level of coaching you ever coached at. That is the most amazing thing. And like I said, I'm glad I left the league because he just destroyed people after. <laughs> he was a heck of a coach. And in fact, one of my kids, Tony Pontis, I think also coached over there, was a running back for me and a uh, good running back. And uh, so I think, you know, I'm, I sounds like I'm kind of talking out of both sides here, but I tried to create a culture where they took responsibility for the results. And, you know, now if some guy said, I want to be all world, I'm going to make 10 workouts. I said, what? I never had a kid do that because I made them look in the mirror. You oh, can yeah. fool. I can fool you. I can fool everybody listening, but I couldn't fool me. You can't fool that guy because he knows the truth. He knows, like, I think it was Mark Twain. He knows the dark side of the moon. Yeah. He knows I think you. there's too many options for athletes today. Meaning, <clears throat> um, you know, when I, when I talk about this kind of like attendance stuff with other coaches is you have uh, a strength coach in the high school. You also have private coaches. I'm a private coach. And the one thing I, I uh, spoke about this and made a video recently, is I said, our athletes are busier than ever before. They go to the nutrition coach. I got to go to a speed coach, then a strength coach, then my skill coach. They have more coaches there, I said, you're doing a Too lot. many chefs spoil, spoil the stew? 100%. So don't confuse activity with accomplishment. So that's what's interesting is if I look back, I started, I kind of got full time into the strength and conditioning in 02. After school, three to four hours of coaching athletes. And our best athletes, <clears throat> they would lift with me, do all the, you know, sports performance stuff. And then they would go. If it was wrestlers, they went to one wrestling club. If it was baseball, they went to one baseball place. And these guys were kicking ass. And they didn't have a million places to go. And I love <clears throat> what you're talking about, you know, in the beginning, Coach, about building kids up to be fit. Like, God forbid you run something, you know, 50 yards, and somebody's like, oh, my God, but – you know, in football, it's four to six seconds. So never run more than six seconds. No, you got to be that. fit. Well, other people say that. Well, but you know, what I say is you'd be able to have them repeat that four to six seconds many times. Correct. But you need it. You need shape. work capacity. You need to that work capacity that I have at the bottom of my pyramid, and you got to be strong. And you got to be, and you got to have that strength reserve and power reserve. Strength is almost but, like a bad word in but today's here, here, sports well, performance. Yeah. Oh, now you don't need to be strong. I never saw it. That's, That's insane. Uh, well, you got a lot of you got you got you have a few people that I uh, how do I want to say it? They would be better not to say things but not to speak. Well, but, let me uh, ask you this question, coach, because you've been around, especially in the, in the professional ranks, you'll hear people say, Hey, if you're too strong, it works against you. You know, only one time did I have a, a wrestler when we were at Lehigh, who I was like, he was benching four or five in season. That's a lot of weight for a, you know, somebody who weighs like 260 pounds. But well, I, I, I bench I more met, than that. I only weigh, I, I bench 400 at 200 pounds. You bench 400 at 200. And I, I military 270. And now we are like afraid to military. And I us. didn't, well, first of all, and I, this, and I hope you don't have a time limit on this. No, thing. we're good, coach. First of all, how many times in life and in a game do you raise your arms above your head? Every time you shoot a basketball, go for a rebound, a layup, catch a ball. Right. Or even if you're a wrestler, you're yeah, outstretched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rob Panarella made it. When you pin yourself on the bench, you affect. Oh, God, he has a better word. I, I'll screw it up. Yeah, but you affect the rhythm in this joint because it's pinned. The scapula can't move. The scapula is made. Anytime you isolate and pin something against something, that's not a natural movement. 
Were you benching I, with your guy? Um, you did the, in the last year I coached high school football, I got rid of the bench. Really? I was more interested. I was more interested in what, what they could clean or jerk. What year was that? Because 1978. So in that time of the Arnold well, bodybuilding well, era. Yeah. Is well, where, now here's the thing. Yeah. Today's game is different because uh, this is going to yank some offensive line. Let's they, do it. <laughs> they, don't know, they don't know how to teach blocking anymore. That's not blocking. They don't know how to get down and use leverage and like the, we had to on a Crowther sled. In those days, if the hands came out, that was illegal least on hands. You had to pass block. So you had to be, have good control of your feet. You had to have good body control. And you had to be able to extend. Now I, I watch them, then they all do it. They zone block and grab someone. I mean, if, if you watch an offensive football and, and pro football, watch and in college, how many times that left tackle moves early and he reaches out and grabs somebody. That's a different game. So bench pressing in the and the and the things uh, that they do. What's that other machine they have where they stand and they push it up? The jammer. Yeah, those things I can understand it. But what I did with the 49er alignment, I can remember we would take the bar and we get in a in a in a pass blocking stance, and I'd have them shuffle on my movement and punch the bar so they could keep control. Because when the bar went out here. You had to keep your butt down and keep good control. We so also had hold a Olympic bar while doing it. Yeah, and they punch and bring it back. That's you could awesome. do with them. You could do. It. And then the other thing we had them do is get down with two dumbbells, and they had to do a pass set and do the same thing. Because when you bring those dumbbells off the ground, you have to drop your butt. You can't stand up. Yeah. How heavy were they doing? Oh, I don't know. You know, yeah, they, just enough to give them the effect they want. But it, about, it was a, um, uh, it was a different game. And when I played, and, and I really think all footballs should have froze the records, all rules, records, new rules. There's a famous pitcher of Y.A. Tittle. You can look it up later. I watched him play as a kid. Y.A. Tittle, Hall of Fame quarterback, played for the 49ers and Giants. And he's kneeling in the end zone. And you'll then see why they didn't throw for 5,000. 4,000 yards. They didn't play as many games either. Right. Because uh, as United said in his book, they had roughing the passer, but they really didn't call. Even when I played, you, you, you they didn't treat you like an endangered species. In fact, I saw in a game the other night or even the announcer said, how was that roughing the passer? But <laughs> it's a different, it's a different game. And you could hit a receiver when I played, that's a long time ago. There was a great receiver named Benny Hawkins played for Arizona State. He later played for the Eagles. We could hit him until the ball was near. So he came across in a crossing pattern. I just set up and gave him a form and knocked him down. No penalty. So you didn't run crossing routes. You didn't do those things. And I heard a famous guy for the 49ers, a great receiver, caught 414 balls named Billy Wilson. He said when he played in the 50s, you didn't run across the middle. He said, especially against the Bears, they'd close line and I'm not saying that's right, but you could hit a receiver until the ball wasn't in the air. So, the, the, so there was a blend of the two games. It was a, that's what I'm saying. It was a different game. And I respect what they do today. God, their offenses are so sophisticated. And, but you couldn't run those screens out there if you had to do this. Yeah. See, people, people don't look how techniques and, and rule changes change things. You know, now golf's all of a sudden trying to dial back to the 48. Well, Bryson DeChambeau said, I'm going to get big and strong and hit the ball far. And uh, so, you know, it's every, every year things change. And I think the athletes are great today. Don't get me wrong. Right. And all that, you know, when, you know, to tell you the difference, now they got rules and how long you can practice. When I was in high school, my last first four years, we had three a days. My last year we had four a days. Well, it goes back to what you said earlier, coach. They're not fit enough to handle it. Think about this. Here's what's scary. Kids are dying during football practice, college kids, you know, from doing things that. Well, some I'm of them are so obese. Right. So I'm not um, uh, defending the coaches when somebody dies, but. Oh, coach, no, you don't for, want to do right. So what I'm saying is, let's say kids do something like. They run a bunch of stairs. They run wind sprints. They squat for five sets of 10. That's killing kids today. Jeez. 
That's... It, it, the, the thing is, though, if you start your program with five sets of 10, you got to make sure that they have a background to handle that. Correct. I don't. I, Kids do I, not have a base anymore. Well, in, in my background, and as I look at, I did things like that. But as I, I, I eventually, did I don't like to keep the bar. I love back squats, but I don't like to keep it on there for more than six to eight reps. And I, and the one thing I've always to always believe is, I always want them to be. Able, I want them to stop the bar, but have the ability to do at least one or two more reps. I always love at that. least one, especially Leave a little on in this, the tank especially for the squat. Hey, if you miss a clean, you just dump it. Correct. But when you're, you are a heavy pull, those long sustained exercises, you know, Hey, I think about they're, this. They're not lifters. You Correct. know, it's just like jump. It's just like jump training. I've seen some things on the internet. Someone puts stuff up there and I'm gone. Oh, I saw, and I don't care if he gets pissed. I thought it was idiotic. Some guy coaching the javelin and he had him taking the, uh, doing uh, like uh uh, oh god pullovers and he was doing some ridiculous thing and i said geez i wouldn't put that on there because some coach would do it. i said well you can't throw this far if you don't do that coach that's a genius did. yeah I this know, is what maybe I... that maybe that one guy it's like if you look at the russians they would have guys jump off a i don't know six foot box and land yeah they were 160 pounds but you don't know the guys that didn't finish that study you know, you, you can't do, you can't, you, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. They put stuff out there. That's just ridiculous. That is a problem. This is what I think about when you were mentioning, leave a rep or two in the tank. And I, I didn't grasp this <clears throat> until I became a coach, but I have a very vivid memory of things that happened in all these different gyms I trained out of as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I tell the kids today, you know, we were trap bar deadlifting. We were squatting. We, different groups. So I said, you always leave one, even two reps in the tank. And I tell them the story. I go, I didn't realize it, but when I was a kid, the strongest guy in the gym, they never were grinding reps. Everything looked just beautiful. They That's made it the look art of coaching. Correct. And then, but as a kid, I'm watching them saying, well, he's not really working that hard because he's not doing forced reps and nobody's helping him. But the strongest That's the greatest guys, way to get hurt. <clears throat> especially course, on the bench on the bench any of those grind reps i just yeah, think any of those exercises take away. that have a long time a long time under tension you know you were talking about the football coach and i don't know why but i don't know why a high school coach today wouldn't be in there in their off season with them see that's where i built all the rapport yes i was with them 12 months a year now what i did do after school got out i gave them three weeks off oh people I said, they need time away from me. They need time to be kids. Uh, three, weeks be three weeks before spring practice, I cut all after school lifting off. They come back fresh, but those kids were well, but here's the kids. They're still <clears throat> kids. Here's I mean, what's I, different I, I though, coach. At, uh, I, I look at today, my granddaughters play volleyball. They'll play for the school and then club. they have to go play in a club team because, you know, because it's all, so and much. it's year round. Yeah. And it, so it, here's it, the thing. Today, kids will rarely work on their own. So when you gave kids three weeks off, they were probably like, you know what? I get back. I, you I, know, I, I they ran. Know that. They did calisthenics. I know, coach, I, they were in such good. I didn't worry about it. First of all, young kids in that day and age, the kids that, that gravitated to the program, I never had to worry about that. They yeah. didn't get that far out of shape. In other so words, today, it, it, we well, don't if have you're going to come and practice, and we took my football team away, <laughs> military bases and then the university of santa cruz if you're going to practice that many times a day you you, you get the right kids see you Correct. set your standards the people that want to do those things gravitated the, the 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 guys the guys or gals that don't want to i mean i wasn't yelling and screaming but this is what we're going to do and they knew they they talked to the group that played before they had to be ready and and again, I was real with them. We had fun. Uh, like you said, I didn't keep the music that loud because I wanted them to hear me, but I understand the modern, and uh, I wouldn't allow cell phones in the weight room. But you asked another question. I want to be concerned. There were guys at the Bulls that didn't lift with me until Phil, you know, made it mandatory except for Michael. Right. And that's fine. And people ask me, <clears throat> they said, would you like to train Michael? Sure, I would. 
but he chose another path. I wasn't going to sit around and worry about it. Correct. And he wasn't obviously worried about it, but I had the other guys to train. Uh, it ended up 49ers. I, there was a guy that played for us and he was in, had a short career and his intellect was part of the reason. He's in explaining one day when I'm doing Olympic lifts or whatever with a guy, why that's important. And yet he didn't do it. He lasted about a year with us. He lasted about another year with another team. Why did the athlete not want to do the Olympic lifts? Just well, no, no, but I mean, <coughs> he's he's promoting them, but not doing it. So that tells you the intellectual ability that this young man, or you know, maybe that's not the correct term. Well, I can't think of the right word. Nonsense. If you think that's that good, why don't you do it? He'd lay over there and, you know, he was a great bench presser and all that. You know, the other thing I told people, you still don't play football on your back. It's still the worst position to be in. And it's in and, and one of the things, if the coaches get nothing else of this, and they're probably really frustrated with me, just think of this. <laughs> First test, can the athlete play? If you improve his ability to absorb ground reaction forces and use them more efficiently, more exp- with greater force in a shorter period of time, you've done your job. Because he'll take that and apply it. The great player will apply it better. The worst player, you won't, you won't see as much. Example, you take an Indianapolis race car, and let's take a name everybody recognizes, should, uh, Mario Andretti. You could probably, he's a great race driver, him and A.J. Foyt. You could probably give him a little less car than a guy who was a fifth, thirty, or fiftieth <clears throat> driver, but he would still excel because he had the skill. It you first must possess the in, I call it instincts, because I know when I played, there were certain things I did instinctively, and I can still think of them. A receiver would run across my face. wasn't my man. We're in zone. I would, I would, you know, in a couple, in, in a particular game playing for my brother, I saved a touchdown. Because I knew that's who they were going to end up. Th- I just knew it. I had like my two centers and linebacker. I had my first three years, I had a kid named Jim Dillon, Catholic All American, played center and linebacker, went both ways. When he left, I took the best freshman lineman. And he, he was a nose guard and an offensive lineman. I made him the linebacker and center because I knew how important that was. But they had instincts to play the game. They had instincts. Why? So because it, they they just knew how to play. Coach, there's some kids that, <clears throat> you know, I was, I was a grunt like me. I know it's 50 years ago at five foot, eight and a half, and a half may be an exaggeration, weighing somewhere between 192 to 200, play 30 college football games, start all 30, and only get knocked out of one with a hit pointer against Nebraska in the second half. I had instincts. I, I knew how to play. Why from but playing I, in the street? You think just, just like my father, my father was a good football player. He had scholarships, but his academic skills in high school were not up to standard. He had to go back for a fifth year and his parents told him no, but he was a good, really good foot because his friends went on and played at some big time pack well, Pacific coast conference schools. Right. And my brothers could play, but you know, it, it's like, why are some kids academically so gifted? Right. It's just some yeah, kids yeah. have the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody has a like, natural talent. It's 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 like people want to be very. Uh, they give me credit, you know. They use words that I don't. I won't use about my career. And I said, if I wouldn't have been with the 49ers or the Chicago Bulls, you wouldn't know who I am. You wouldn't know the job I did at Moore High School. And now the new field is named after me by the insistence of my players. And I'm not saying that boastfully, but that's just a fact. You wouldn't have known if I coached for the Detroit Lions and who else hasn't won an NBA championship, the New Jersey Nets at that Any time. New Jersey team would just struggle here. Well, but you wouldn't know me. So it was based on the organizations I was with, All right. the coaches, the players, the scouting staff, the medical staff, and your relationship with the league. See, and when I was in the pro football, the players would, you could have a lot longer off season. Now that's all legislated at right. five weeks, which is a joke. That's the owners don't, that's nothing. Well, the owners don't realize their biggest assets are players and they're not getting an investment for many months out of them. And it's someone should tell the owners, well, 
if you give me all the money you've got and I'll invest it for you, but for four months, I won't get you any return. What do you mean? I'm not going to do that. Well, that's what you're doing by not having the players in there. Yeah, you're not yeah. getting an investment. And then I think what happens is then they want to be with a private special well, coach. Because, you know. because they can pay <clears throat> and, and tell them what to do. They weren't going to come in my weight room. I don't care who it was and tell me how to coach them. What, coach, they didn't when, want to work with me. When They're you not, mentioned just, that how your high school program, the exercises are similar to in the pros. Let's do you remember what you did three days a week with your high school kids? What did like it? What, well, how did I, a I warm remember, up look? How did a well, warm up look? Oh, Jesus, it's, you know, you didn't have to warm up a lot. Um, in the off season, we, we also went in the morning, but in the off season, we went three days a week. And in California at that time, you know, it was raining and you couldn't go out. I don't remember how we warmed up. I just remember we lifted, got stronger. And when we added the jumps, we would jump on the wrestling mat and we'd jump over things. And we'd use the church pews for in-depth jumps onto the wrestling mat. And of course, Don Chu was up at Cal State Hayward. Yes. So he was a huge influence on me. And later I met Charlie Francis, who was a huge influence. Uh, so uh, we just went about it in the summer. Full body we workouts, I'm assuming. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. We didn't do any of that you know, I wasn't, you know, football players at that time, football players, by the time they finished their, finished their freshman year, and I started the freshman about four weeks before their season or started working with them. What did and you so, do with them, the beginner Just guys. basic, taught them the lifts, taught them the squat. I wasn't smart enough to use the complex at that time. Uh, didn't know about it. But what I'm saying, by the time they finished their freshman year, the rugged people that can tolerate playing football is a lot different than the skinny six foot six basketball player you get. So I was only dealing with kids, you know, it, basically they were football player type bodies. Yeah. And, and, and the mentality. And so, you know, you could, uh, they just developed in the summertime. I can tell you what we did. We'd warm up, we'd do the running drills. We would, and I, we would run, six downhill sprints and we'd start with six uphill four downhill then reverse it two days a week and uh and we probably uh, my last two years we only worked out monday through thursday now i don't think that's the best way i think it i like five days a week or monday tuesday thursday friday but i wanted the kids to have three days away from me i wanted them to be kids i wanted them if they wanted to do something uh and, and then we did the lifts and jumps. And at that time, I called Don Chu. I said, what when we're squatting or lifting, if we combine the jumps, go lift and do jumps, which now is called complex training. Which I love. And I said, yeah. and when I, I did that for time, but also we're going to build my termination term, terminology at that time was fast strength. And we did, then we also, I'd read something about doing uh, your body weight, 60% uh, of your body weight in five seconds. So one day a week, we'd squat for speed. And then when they got faster, we used to stop. Which I don't know how accurate it was, but it was a point of reference. They'd add load. So Monday and Thursday were our speed power days. The other days were more strength. And we do our 30-second station, which would What's be- What's a 30-second station? Well, it was, is you had five groups, if I remember correctly. One group jump rope. One group got on one side of the key and they ran back and forth lateral change. You couldn't, you could not, I'll send it to you. You could not turn and run. You couldn't turn a circle. Your foot had to hit the line or go over. The other kids would count. You would do the back pedal from the free shot line and your right foot had to go over the, over the, uh, excuse me, from the baseline to the free shot line. First time your right foot had to open up and drive back the second time you had to alternate the other thing we used crab we had your hand and foot had to get over the line you'd be in crab, all crab walking no in a, hands and feet we had crab and you had to put your hand and foot over the line and do yeah. as many as you could for 30 seconds and then we had a blocking bag now i don't remember the exact type i would say it was probably somewhere between 14 to 16 inches maybe 18 at most a shield and I had a couple kids that could go over that and do 60 or more in, in 30 seconds. And I had records for all this. To me, and, coach. And this... here's what we did. Here's the important part. 
factors, not just how we, what we did. We'd go through it twice and you you do it. I'd count for you. So the group, and then if I'd blow the whistle, they had to go to the next group, break down and move in, in a football. And if they didn't do it right, I don't care if your group did, this guy let you down, do it again. So we went through that twice. And, um, uh, so, you know, and we made a run some intervals at that time. It's a long, long time ago, but that was the basic crux of the program. Uh, and I was, I'm losing my train of thought on something. Well, I was saying. what about well, the bar also, let me, let me give you this that you should okay. give your football coach. One of the things I think I did do right was on defense, or excuse me, in football practice, every time we changed a drill and you ran to your coach, you had to break down and move in and he'd give you a single. So you had to slide and then move this way. If one group didn't write, they all did it again. See, I'm not yelling and screaming. You didn't give me your best effort. Do it again. They learn quick. Now here's the key. And the if any, if any of your football coaches and you've, I've already destroyed my image as a coach because I coached in a different ear, but here's one thing you can still do. If you don't miss tackles, you don't lose football games. You can take all this fancy. You don't miss it. How many times do you watch a guy? They come up and hug them anymore. You know why? Because they don't teach block on those Crowthers and Rogers sled to extend. You watch how many times a ball carrier, you'll have five guys around will blow the whistle and the ball carrier is still up. You're right. Five they, guys. They don't, they don't, they don't stick them. They don't come in there. I know you're not can't. When I played, I got that old forehead because they've stuck your hat in there, but you can't do that, but you can still get a great blow with a shoulder pad. He may be better, but they did don't. Your, did your high school have wrestling coach Vermeil? Did the football yeah, players yeah. wrestle? Some of them did. I encouraged it. our offensive line coach, Dwayne Paws, who did a great job, uh, was a wrestling coach, but here's the thing we did on defense. Whatever type of scrimmage we were having, full team, I would blow the whistle. But we may not always been full contact in terms of tackling. I can't remember. The first whistle killed contact. The second whistle, every defensive player had to break down and be at that football. And then they'd go back and do it again. And when I, in some years when I had a large squad, I would have two offensive teams. So they had to hustle, go back, get in position and play again. So your practices were run at a fast, aggressive pace. Yeah, we didn't. We're, I, I did too many coaches, even in the strength and conditioning, want to give a lecture how to get into a hang. Here's how you get in a hang. Your butt goes back, your shoulders go forward. Well, if your butt goes back, your weight goes towards your heels, if your shoulder, and keep your, don't lose your posture in your back. Butt back, shoulders forward, and you go down to wherever you want to get to hang. And if you can't, if you got kids that can't get in a hang, you better be working a hell of a lot on that. And and we and even in pro football, we pulled off the floor or short blocks. I think you got now in the Bulls, because you were so tall, Horse was the only big guy that could really pull off the floor. I've got him, I've got a video of him cleaning. I saw it. Yeah, cleaning. Well, I've got him one at off six inch blocks, three hundred. But I've got him one uh, clean and jerk and one ten off the floor. He he was he made me a great coach. Again, it wasn't me. He was a guy waiting for for someone to give him some basic things. And and for all you coaches out there, and maybe in basketball, and I see these guys are all doing this, you know, all guy load, you know, monitoring, which is good. You know what we did at Chicago Bulls? We squatted, we pulled, we push pressed or pressed. They, some guys did some bench and they want to do it. We clean, snatched, pushed, pressed, pushed, whatever they could do. Some didn't do both. Some did one, you know, whatever they could do. And they said, what else should you do? We ran Charlie Francis's tempo. We did a lot of medicine ball throws. We did some sprint. Work. How about jumping? Only enough. I said, they've been jumping, jumping all their life. Yeah. yeah. Right, and I right. said, those knees to read to cover. They said, well, what'd you do the next year? I said the same thing. Why? Because most of them weren't strong enough to start with. And it gave us the power and strength and endurance to manage the season. Now, with that said, we didn't win the championship until we got great players, and we didn't win anymore when they all left. I think, and I was uh, doing the same things. But on my point being is, we were doing the same things. Were you so, with the team in Chicago when I watched that documentary, 
and they lost to a team oh. that was so was it Utah Jazz? They were like so physical that they said we got to lift weights. Well, no, that was that was okay. <clears throat> Let me give you a little and, and listen to this carefully. If the fans want to hear the true story of that yes. whole thing, I'll give you two things. Go on YouTube and, and search Bill Cartwright. He has a 30 minute thing about that whole thing. And Billy Cartwright was one of the toughest guys I ever coached and one of the great human beings I had to be associated with. He is one of the really fine people. What a tough guy he was. And then go on mad dog sports and look up the interview I did. And then you can mad ju- dog with coach mad dog. Uh, Sir- no, no, no serious radio. Okay. And you'll hear, he interviewed me and asked me all those questions. I was with the team all the time and it made it seem like we didn't start lifting weights until Michael got hurt against Detroit. We were lifting weights oh, all the Detroit. time. Yeah. Yeah, Tim Grover was not the strength <clears throat> coach of the Chicago Bulls. And he and, and and somehow it tried to portray that. Those videos were when I was working with those guys. And the only guy I never worked with was Michael, and I'm never going to take any credit. He was a great player, tremendous leader, work ethic, the whole thing. But there's other sides to that whole story if you look that if they're willing to look yes, at that. Yes, I will and, I will and, also and, link that and up. Scotty Pippen one year, uh, our last year. And uh, it was 97, 98. He had had surgery and they were going to let someone else rehab it. And I looked at the assistant general manager, Jimmy Stack, and he said, you're not going to say anything? No, because you'll come back to me in about November. Came off the West Coast road trip. They said, you got to go back and work with them. I said, great. We're always here. Scotty came back and did a great job. Uh, And we had worked with Scotty a lot in his first four or five years. And, you know, I've got videos of all the guys lifting and that, but, you know, that they some... tried to portray that. And I was uh, the only thing I, I don't care if they didn't have me in there. I was on the very first part of a young guy in a blue shirt, but that was not true. The bulls had been lifting long after that. Also go to Stacy King's podcast is another one. I Stacy uh, was another one that we, we discussed this whole thing. Okay, great. Well, uh, Coach, I'm not taking I'm not going to take any credit for it, but I'm also not going to let someone else portray because that's not the truth. And right. I have and anytime they want to argue with me, I've got the video of them trying. and you ask them. So what was um who, so um it was the Detroit those guys were just like street tough, is that what yeah, they but, Yeah, yeah, but they knocked Michael down. All the other guys in that court were lifting. Yeah. And in what it took it what it well, they hurt Michael in the first. I was there, yeah, and you know, I may you know, and you were allowed to do things then, and, he, and now you can't, him be. And it takes a while for you to believe you are number one, you can be the best. And each year, we went a little further in the playoffs, and Phil did a great job of managing. You know, I'm, I'm sometimes you watch teams. And they win the first round and they expend all their energy afterwards. They think they've done it. They don't realize there's another round. And Detroit had experience. They had won it a couple of times. And once you win it, you, you believe you should win. And they were tough. And I'll give you a quick story. Yes. Uh, John Sally, we think it was John, told me late in his career we got him. He said, you don't know what you lost when you lost Bill Cartwright. He said, none of us wanted to go down the middle. You're afraid so of we, you know, we, we had like Stacy and Billy Cartwright and Will Purdue, Kerr, uh, Winnington, and Coop Coach, uh, Harper. Harper's a guy that doesn't get enough credit for us winning the last three. Harper was unselfish. He was a heck of a scorer at one time. Coach. But he was. <laughs> you mentioned he, Will Purdue, and a friend of mine <clears throat> sent me some photos of a special squat rack that you had built. For, I guess Will Purdue is seven foot one, a special half rack squat rack. I'll text you the photos. Well, the, he, those half racks, those he has half racks, I, I'd send it to me, but those half racks were really made. You know, this video is going, this going from, and another story, you know, some people, there's a company that takes credit for being the first half rack, and I don't take credit for anything. When I was with the 49ers after we won the Super Bowl, a guy sends me some material, and I call him. He said, Well, you're responsible. In fact, in the letter, he said, you're responsible for me lifting weights and starting my company. I said, I've never met you. 
Well, apparently I had competed against him in the shot put and uh, I outthrew all these big guys by five feet. They hadn't, and he said, I never saw a guy lift the weights. I mean, I was throwing 50 something and, and, you know, and I'm five foot at that time, probably uh, 870 pounds, 75 at best. And I'm throwing a five feet and these guys are six, three, six, two. And, and I ended up throwing a 54, nine officially, but in high school, but that wasn't good enough to even get in state, but that's not the point. But he, I said, oh, you make a rack. I said, guys don't like to lift in power racks. They're a waste of time. I said, cut it in half. He did that in 1982. And that's the rack they're seeing. I'll send you the, the photo of but, it. So my friend but, has it's guys it. like Guys like Will uh, all contributed and I'm sure I'm missing. I've had, I, I already talked about Pippen and, and John Paxson was another guy, BJ Armstrong, all those guys, you know, you know, people don't understand. They are just human beings. And, and, you know, they think, well, they're famous athletes are making all this money. They don't have problems. Everybody has problems. And in dealing with people and the guys that didn't live with me during the years, I always talked to them. I didn't turn a cold shoulder to them. You know, if they, if they were on men, you know, it's like Dennis Rodman, you know, I was, you know, I watched him train and we'd talk and we talked about a player that I had told the Bulls not to draft and he ended up being better than I thought. And I was a little nervous and Dennis said, he can't hold the block. I said, thank you. Cause that's what I told them. And, uh, but I watched him and, you know, he was a smart player. He was, a, he, he understood the angles and all that. You know, I had nothing to do with Dennis Rock in terms of training, but we got along fine. So you have to realize at each level, you have to recognize, you know, what is the old saying? God, give me the, the intelligence to know what I can control and what I can't something to that effect. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you, you still just be people. And I used to have the, I used to have the professional football players to my house when I was with the 49ers. And, and one time we had a big offensive tackle, uh, a great guy. He came in with a big purse, you know, they were, they were used. And my, my late son, Lance went, my dad's going to throw you out of here with that purse. And another guy came in with earrings. He said, yeah, he doesn't like earrings either. <laughs> and when the guy left, we all said goodbye. And he said, yeah, don't bring the earrings next time. Uh, all the guys laughed. And um, then I did the same with the bulls. We had the VSF. You bring them over your house. Yeah. And the VSF golf outing. And you never saw a guy slice a ball as far, but we had fun. So I think being demanding, and I may have left the wrong impression. It's setting a standard not accepting a poor effort. I don't think that's my, and you set those standards and, and you raise the intensity after a while and they're surprised what they can do. And you you're ask them to them do it. You're asking them to do it when they're capable of doing it. Oh, it's written today. We've got to do this. And he ain't got it. So we ain't doing it. The coach's you know, eye. Uh, yeah. And, a lot of, you know, if you're only by software and you don't have coach's oh, eye, and I think, I don't want to say I think, I know that that is a missing link. So, for example, you've been coaching, I believe, longer than I've been alive. I'll be 46 in a month. Oh, yeah. Right. You, your eye is way more trained than mine. And then for it me. It took a long time to train it. it and here's the other crazy thing. long here's, time. You're right. Here's what, here's what helped train it. I'll give you a couple examples. I thought the guys were doing the running drills great. And Charlie Francis would come in and even Ben Johnson, and he'd have him do them or Charlie would do them, make a correction. My eye got better. I remember one time Charles Pollockton came in. Charles was a character and the guys were jerking and he was doing pretty good. He said, yeah, but I, he was the best guy, but his elbows were down. So he got his elbows up. Dragomir Sorosian would come in and he would do something. Oh, okay. That's how it's supposed to look. So you've got to get people who are great examples to train your eye. So you either got to get an athlete that can do it or a coach. And here's the one thing I always told coaches, don't put anything in your program that you haven't tried. I did in-depth jumps. Uh, I actually tried. I was bounding some until my mid-60s. 
but just fooling around with it. But because uh, I thought it was real hard, then I started doing it, and I realized it wasn't hard on the body as much as I thought it was. But but my point is, I did single leg hops when we put it in. I made some mistakes in that. We were kid wasn't doing it good in place. Don't do a single leg hop in place. Absolutely one of the. That's one of my top ten dumbest. The kid hurt his knee and couldn't play that year. And, you know, he didn't have to have surgery. How and he was not somebody's uh, knee just uh, hopping uh, up in there. Uh, uh, yeah, well, he was big. Wasn't yeah. in condition to do it. Oh, yeah. He was he was a kid I let on the team. I never cut anybody because it oh, was good for him. Oh, high school team, you're saying? Yeah, yes. it was good for him to be on the team. Right. And then he didn't get to play much until the end of the season. I don't know if he did. And a poor young man had passed away. His name was Jeff Montgomery. And I still feel bad about that. And I told him that. And, and you know, but that was my inexperience. So you're best to, when you try something, learn to do it yourself. Learn now, I remember the first time. The different body structures. Not with, not with your players watching you. Right. Well, it's like you're <laughs> saying a big guy is going to need some sort of a regression compared to a skill guy. Uh, well, he wasn't. Not always, but most he wasn't really a player. He was just kind of. Just, he was a good kid. Yes. A nice yes. young man. But he wasn't going to be, you know, he was right. going to play when we're way ahead or way behind. Right. You're so, going to have, but coaches are going to have those but kids. I did, he, it, I, it, it was my inexperience. And, yeah. when I'm, you know, and people always want to introduce me with all these superlatives. Hell, I am no different than anybody else. I made a ton of mistakes. Hopefully I learned from most of them. There are a couple I repeated on game day and that's what hurts. But, and I, I had ideas for the offense and the veer to expand it, and I never did. Now, my off-season program was far ahead of everybody else's at that time, what we were doing. With far your ahead. strength training? Well, well there, no one was doing plyos and football, downhill running and all the things. But yeah. my point being, I didn't have enough confidence. No one else is doing it. So anyway, but what I'm saying is when you deal with athletes at all different, even in high school, even if a kid can come in and do what he wants, Still treat him with respect. Treat every guy with respect. You never know when you may change someone's mind, but you can't change someone's mind if yours is closed. If yours is closed and you're, you're going to be, well, you're not work with me. I hate you. No. I mean, you don't have to run over and hug them, mm -hmm. but you don't have to treat them with disrespect. That's a good and, one. and all you high school coaches, whatever sport, Strength coaches, you're working with teams. Try to encourage that team sport coach to come in with you. Have him understand. I've said this a lot, coach, that if the head coach doesn't even pop in, then the kids are probably thinking, well, I want that guy in my schedule because I'll beat his ass because he doesn't care enough to be there unless he's I'm, coaching another. Just show he's up for five another, minutes. If he's not coaching another sport, my brother would go down there as a head coach in the NFL. Yeah, he can go down and work out. And if you if you don't have, I don't care if it's football, girls tennis, volleyball. If you don't have enough interest to see what your athletes are doing, boy, I want you in my schedule. I, I want to open with that one. <laughs> Maybe not it's, late in the season, but early. Right, you know, I see this be, uh, a lot. That if you're not, enough. yeah, you got to be in there and show that you care. But you know what? If you don't care, that's. Fatal. But you not only care, you want to know what you're doing. It's you yeah. want you want to you want to grow as a person. I'm trying to think of all I, I bounced all around, and yeah. I, I know the coaches are saying, "Well, Jesus, how many reps and sets?" Don't get hung up in all that. Yeah. Here's the first thing in planning a program: How many athletes do I have? Right. How much? First of all, how much time do I have? Yes. Number one, time. Athletes two facilities three number of coaches so if you've got a 10-hour program and you've got five hours to work then you've got to look and prioritize where you know what did i do with the bulls we didn't have time constraints we couldn't make them be there we could not the year we won the first championship the players averaged 55 workouts that summer and there were only about 70 to 75 possible and billy cartwright and pax had surgery so they missed some they wouldn't have uh, but uh, what I'm saying is we needed to get stronger. So I prioritize what we need. That doesn't mean we didn't do some of the other things, but prioritize what is this group's, what can you do 
that's going to give them the biggest bang for their buck and affect performance. And at that time, it was strength. Now kids are lifting in college. It's a little different, but I don't know. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I'm not in a team anymore, so I don't know how prepared to come in. But what I'm saying is look at time when you have a foot, but see, here's the other point I wanted to make. If you're a young coach now listen to me carefully, you go out and coach a team sport, whether it be basketball, I like basketball and football, soccer would be good, rugby, because you have to keep moving, coaching. Baseball is a little slower. Great sport, great skill sport. Uh, I would coach, and then that would teach you to coach large groups. Then coach, go watch a guy coach track and field. Watch him coach the jumpers to learn the, the sprinters and the throwers. You'll learn elastic speed, which speed is elastic, and the thrower's power. And they're probably teaching some Olympic lifts. And go look at what the Olympic lifting, go find a guy that can teach Olympic lifts. Go learn what you don't know. And hire Dick Sid, you know, the great Hall of Fame coach, Sid Gilman. Dick hired him, I believe, in about 1980-81 at Philadelphia. And people said, why would you hire a guy like that? You know, like maybe you'd be threatened. He said, I want to hire people that know something I don't. Today, though, coach. Um, but that's you, today. But the point, the point of the thing, coach, uh, I don't want to sit here and make excuses today. I'm telling you, if you want to be good, this is what you need. If you don't want to. Well, you're mentioning earlier, <clears throat> you're connecting with Charlie Francis, Charles Poliquin. You know, Don when Chu. I started, yeah, Don Chu, when I started coaching, I remember, you know, I was an elementary Dragomir Shirozhin. Yes. I mean, I could list you. And where was you know Dragomir? Many, he, he, he was in Colorado. Oh, he Colorado. was at Colorado. And, and then I'm Yuri Vardanian, coach my son. And then all the sports medicine people I met, Jeff Montgomery, Jeff Montgomery, excuse me, Jeff Coverly out in, in uh, Colorado, Chad Brinskenhofer, um, Mark, uh, Mark Comerford, a great physical therapist, Michael Shacklock, all about the nerves, Pete Emerson. I had I t uh, one of the people ask me how I do what I do. Well, I usually see, at, I'll go for periods or sometimes I'll see a PT once a month to keep mo mobile. There was a lady in Chicago that was great. Mary Evans helped me a ton, keep me mobile. Uh, and I'm probably forgetting people. And I apologize every time I do these things. Rob Panarella became you mentioned friend. him earlier. Well, I didn't meet him for eight years because he was the first one to squat ACLs. And there was some question by our medical staff about squatting. So I would talk to Rob and we became great friends. Unfortunately for him, every time I've got a problem, I call him. You know, Chu doesn't want to hear for me because Chu's got the same problems I do. <laughs> I, I have friends like that. But what you're talking about is as coaches, you need to go out and seek information. The internet you know, I, I talk about this a lot. I didn't share it with you, but I remember a coach said to me, he goes, listen, you know, if uh, I'm going to watch a YouTube video or an Instagram video, and if it's longer than two minutes, I'm probably not watching it. And I said, well, you can't be great that way. You need to get in your car and you need to travel and immerse yourself and learn well, from uh, another well, coach. One of the th you know, one of the things... I was fortunate at Chicago. I had a young man come to work for me late 1987 named Eric Killen. Then he took over from me, went to Wisconsin, did a great job. Now he's working in private field. And so it was great because he was. What was his name? Eric Hillen? H-E-L-L-A-N-D. And he, he, he was the opposite of me in terms, you know, I'd fly off the handle. You know, I, I mean, I've got a really short fuse and especially when I was younger. So. Eric was calm, and you know, so it was a great relationship. You, I, you don't want to hire I, you don't want to hire another one with the same personality. Christ, that would have been a disaster. But so you surround yourself with knowledge, and you know, even when I was a high school football coach, we would call coaches. You know, I don't care who where they were, big time school. How are you running this on the river? What are you doing here? Uh, knowledge, knowledge is is. I don't want to use that word. Knowledge, absorbing knowledge and knowing how to apply it gives you an edge up. Yes. And my and my late father always said, you're never so good you can't get better. Boom. It didn't matter how, you know, you're I I I played for nine years of football. And I remember one compliment, and he may have gave me a few others. I remember I know one he gave me that was opposite him. And he was and 
there was no arguing with them. Okay, you're right. We played our big rival, St. Lean, and we lost in the rain. Our, our in a little school of 150 kids, our quarterback couldn't play. We had to use a sophomore. And I walked in the house and he said, you played yourself a football game tonight. Now that's 1962. And I remember, and I can look and see him right in my mind's eye. And that's how important that comment was to me. But uh, you, you've you got, and he always said, you're never so good, you can't get, and you can learn from everybody. You don't have to agree with everybody. You know, today is, if you don't do everything on one leg, you're wrong. Or if you don't do everything on two legs, you're wrong. No, everything's a combination. There's a purpose. The advantage of two leg squats is it strengthens your body more because you can handle bigger loads. You need better, it strengthens your adductors, your hip joints have to be more mobile to get in that deep squat. Yes. The single leg is great for stability. It, it works the body a little bit differently. You need a combination. Uh, as an old man, I do my single leg work when I do it. After I do my double leg, because I've already warmed it all up, and it's uh, I'll do something. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't do a lot of it as I've gotten older because of certain reasons, but, you know, I, you know, and D, you know, everybody thought all we did is Olympic lift. That might've been 30% of our volume, maybe 40 at the most. So, you know, it, it wasn't everything we did. See, there's you, too much today is I'm only this, I'm all that. It's, well, like, it's too much. It's too much like politics. A hundred percent. That I mean, to you know, be a great strength course, coach, I think you need, common sense hey i'll hey, take this, someone from i'll, I'll yeah. take someone from some i mean I, like i said there are people out there i vehemently disagree with but they may say something or show something i said that makes sense right well i'm not so proud to know uh, to say that i don't know everything or that i was wrong then okay the first time i read about plyometrics it was an article in scholastic coach or modern or uh, scholastic coach there was another one those two, co I can't remember the other one. And it was by Fred Wilt. Oh, we're going to improve your power with this jumping. Ah, they're not lifting weights. I've had to sit there for a few months. I started rereading it. Then I realized Don Chu's up on the hill, you know, and he, he took care of my players. We called him Dr. Chu. So I thought he was a doctor. He was a trainer and he took care of all my players. That's the other reason my, we had on the varsity. We had one knee surgery in six years and we had maybe one or two at the lower levels in six years. I know for one, and I'm not sure after I left, there might've been one more after I left, but, but you know, and we did, the only single leg work we did is bounding, hopping, and the best single leg work is sprinting mm -hmm. and running downhill. Cause now the hill was how fast did we speed them up? No more than 5.5, no more than about 5%. Carl Melo Bosco became a friend of mine, the late Carmel, and he did a study with towing and he says, you don't want to speed them up anymore than about 5 to 5.5% are your stub. But when you're running downhill, you have to learn to absorb the ground quicker and a greater force because you're running downhill. You're running faster than and that. You have to learn to absorb that and get the leg cycle back through. So I, there are a lot of reasons. Those and the are kids things we great. did as kids. <laughs> well, well, the other thing is this. Don Chu told me your kids were always in a fundamental good position. What did I talk about? All off season breaking down on the field, breaking down people, you know, Oh, we don't have time to do that. Oh, okay. Keep missing tackles. The other thing is we'd play games and coaches would say our team was sore for three days because we gang tackled. We were going to be around that football. And I said, I wanted that ball carrier to get up and look at 11 gold helmets. You know, you, you, you know, but I was a defensive player. I played offense. So obviously we didn't throw the ball well. One time we, I said, we really got after it. We went four for seven. <laughs> Coach, um, you know, I, who was your early mentor? Was it uh, Alvin Roy in strength and conditioning? Pardon? Who was your early mentor for like strength well, training and well, sports? The, I should have mentioned the guy that was my early mentor was my brother's high school football coach in 1953 and four. His name was Bill Wood. He I wonder where away. he got well, he, his information well, he, from. He, well, he coached them and then he left to you know, Novato High School and later Santa Cruz and he put a weight training program. He got it from LSU, I believe, Alvin Roy, who's Alvin the godfather. Roy. So Coach Wood came back up at Christmas. They bought me a set of weights, 110 pound health weights. I can still see it. Health ways, yeah. 
it's long gone, I'm sure. But you the, can find uh, them on Facebook, like uh, used. Coach, Hollywood uh, Heathways, Healthways, yeah. No, it was Healthways. I was all remember. So anyway, Coach Wood came up and gave me my first program. It was one set of ten, one set of six, one set of one. When they came, when you could do more each other, you bumped up the weight. And the warm up, I didn't realize it was a basically a clean grip snatch. And then we just started lifting. That was our warm up. We didn't have to. We just, you know, young kids. Sure. And I'll never forget one day one of the partners couldn't be. We had no stands. And I had to lift the bar to put it on the kid's back to squat. And I wasn't very strong at that. And I lifted it, it was a hundred pounds and I pressed it. And I said, oh my God, I'll probably never do more than that for you know months. Well, I ended up pressing my body weight by the end of the first year. Of high school. And, uh, yeah, and a, as a freshman. Yeah, that's very strong. Well, my dad was a big part, you know, again, genes. And my mom was strong. So, but the point being is Coach <laughs> Wood gave me that. It changed my whole life. Because I was the youngest, uh, you know, my brothers and sister were born and raised during the Great Depression. A lot of it, things were tougher. And it gave me a sense of purpose. And it taught me that if you want to do something, you got to do it right all the time. And in health ways, the, your training manual opened up and said, every time you miss a workout, it becomes easier to, to miss the next one. That's uh, and that's in 1959. I started lifting in January 7th because it was after Christmas. And my brother came up to me. My brother, Stan, who also coached me in high school, was a really good football player. He, he said, those weights aren't going to lift themselves. Did you read Strength and Health magazine? Oh, yeah. Bill, I remember Bill March was the first 198 to go 1,000 pounds and, oh, and functional ice. And then yeah. I still have got Alvin Roy's original LSU manual that Paul Dietzel with football and it's called the Chinese bandits, which you couldn't use that term. It has his original it's called program. the Chinese what bandits. Cause what they had <laughs> in those days, what they had in those days, coach, they had a, you had to play both ways. So the great Billy Cannon Heisman trophy winner played defense. Everybody remembers the great run he makes against Mississippi, the Holloway run, but they don't realize when Mississippi had third and Goal to goal on fourth down. Who made the tackle? Billy Cannon. He was playing linebacker or deep center back. But I have that, and I have Alvin Roy's book that he used for the Chargers with the uh, functional isometrics. So I had read that, and the, the and the, and I read when I was coaching at Castle Robley something about the knees move back underneath the bar, but I couldn't figure out how to do that. And then when I went to Casa Robley, I had Jimmy Schmidt come over and help my players. Then I brought the late Carl Miller, another guy that helped me. Carl came in and helped me. And he was a, a big influence through my whole life. Carl and I remained friends for till he's passing about a year ago. And, uh, and of course, I brought Don in. On a podcast, Ethan, stop it. And then Sorry, Coach. I, I, then I brought Don in. And then uh, at the 49ers, I brought I brought people in uh, and then the bulls i brought in you know i brought in don again charlie uh drag i brought uh oh god dick smith the great guy from york barbell then yuri and and oh god i can't remember car charles came in uh i mean uh i and uh all Lauren the C, all this lauren c graves and of course i'm a personal friend of al miller so we traded things back of johnny parker yes uh, so I, I, I'm, and I'm doing, you know, and people, I forgot, I apologize. And then, you know, <laughs> and, and then Johnny, Gar, and then, and then Johnny Garhammer and Mike Stone. And then, you know, I was fortunate. And when I got older, I hired guys besides Eric. Then I hired uh, uh, Mike Catone, who's done a great job with USA weightlifting, tremendous coach, tremendous coach. And then he left. And then I hired Jeff Macy, who was out at Oregon state. And then I've got at, uh, at North Carolina basketball, I got Jonas Serration. I got Damon Davis down in Auburn that were interns for us. I got, oh, God, God I, I, we had a nickname for him, and I don't want to call him. Oh, Tim, I'm trying to think of his name. He's been an outstanding guy, and I, I'm doing, I, Timmy, I apologize. Oh, God, I can't think of his last name. I, I have get these old. two, these, like, brain fog. I well, I'll, tell, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you who he is real quick. <laughs> no, that's not what I want. I'll get that out of here. Uh, come on, get that out of here. Uh, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, get me here. Tim. Jesus, I should remember. He's a good guy. Uh, Timothy Rabbis is a really good strength coach. I think he's in pro football. I'll probably screw up. I'm not sure he's with somebody right now. I can't remember. But we've had uh, just a number of guys that were in. Uh, a guy that does a great job in private business down there in Naples is Rick Lederman. Uh, he does a great job down there. What's his last he, name, Coach? Rick Lederman. He was an intern to, to me. Uh, it's Beyond Motion is his company, Beyond Motion. Great, I'll look. Up, I'll look him up. So you know, and of course, I, I'm, I, you know, I, I've worked for Perform Better, so I, I, I know Mike Boyle. He's still and, working uh, with Perform no, Better. No, they, they, oh. they don't want someone that looks nine hundred years old up there talking. They want it's... young people. <laughs> well, no, they want people that are talking about, you know, because I, I, like I told Chris, who's a wonderful Chris Poyer and Mike. Yes, I know guys. Chris. Yeah. And Chris and Mike are special friends for another reason I won't discuss here, but, uh, uh. They want people who are going to talk in the terminology today. I, I told Chris, I can't, I can't say it any differently. This is what I did. I can only say it, and I'm not going to go out and try to say it a different way. Right. right. You're not going to think it. And look, well, I, and Chris wouldn't want me to, but they, they have their way of, you know. And I, so I don't, I don't, I don't do any coach. But you understand. This is what I say a lot, and I'm almost 46, and people are like, he's old school, but. You know, because I'm in the high school private setting, we'll see kids. They'll come to us from another facility and you'll have kids that were somewhere else. If they didn't get strong, they ran around a lot of cones, but they can't do a pull up. You know <laughs> oh, what yeah. I mean? I they, get can't a boot do, all that. they can't, you know, dumbbell bench properly. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd uh, be careful dumbbell benching that opens your shoulder a lot. Well, I would keep. We go uh, neutral. Keep it, keep like, it. Oh, good. Oh, neutral grip. Good idea. I like to go neutral. And that's actually good because it gets your triceps a little more. Yeah, you're gonna elbows in. But try that drill. Try the drill where they take the dumbbells out of their stance, and now they yeah. have to punch and shove because now they're. I like that. And are the barbell when they're straight up already have it because now they have to the move and they have to control their balance. You know that's the other thing I, I see a lot stuff. of people doing about core, and I've spent time. I have a saying, if you want to learn something, go to the originator, not the impersonators. 100%. Go to the originator. Yeah. Well, I went to the Australians. All that core stuff was for people that hurt their back, had back problems. And you see people doing all this core work. I said, if they have back pain, is it sitting, standing, walking? Yes. Do they have it under high loads? No. Well, then all that stuff you're doing doesn't help. And we have, there's people out there, well, you've got to get stiff you got to be careful making people robots. But if you squat clean, if you do the athletic lifts, squat and, and pull and press, clean, snatch, jerk, jump, your body's and under those, especially the grinding loads, you're learning to stiffen it up, but you have body movement. But holding a static position means you've only got strength there and you're not on your feet. And doctor, you can look this up. This guy's name is Dr. Tom Nesser. I can't remember which school he's out of, Missouri. And he did a paper. It's in the strength coaches journal or one of the journals there. And he found that the squat was far better than the plank. Common sense. Yeah. Now, the plank isn't bad for a leader. Right. But don't tell me you're working. Here. Uh, uh, or you got to do the bird dog. If your guys are that's effed up at that point, you know, we never do. You know, but if you've got a back problem, yeah. You know, well, he can't pass that test. It's a learned skill. Give him a couple of days. Right. And the right. only way you can tell if the multifidus isn't working, you've got to use ultrasound. And in fact, you've got to, there's some people, I fooled Mark Comerford, who's a world-class therapist from Australia, a friend of mine. He said, oh yeah, it's you, you've got independent control. Let me put the ultrasound. Yeah, you have. He put the Doppler, which showed blood flow. I didn't. And he had to put me in a special position and your transverse abdominus will work unless you're dead. It's a timing mechanism and it's rehabbed under non-functional. And you got all these guys, well, we got to spend an hour in the core. Everything you do, it's like they think the core is, Jesus, Jesus. I mean, it's a waste of time. Well, we're, you know, coach, this is, you know, so much of you what know you what say, I call I'm sure it? that, yeah. And this isn't nice. I'm going to probably offend someone. Let's do it's it. It's a lot of, it's a lot of mineral masturbation going on. That's what my father, I mean, Jesus, 
Oh, he could squat for him. Well, we better get and do the bird dog. Come on. Here's a, here's what I what I say is movement is your best medicine. So if you're not feeling too hot, do some body weight work. Throw some light yeah. medicine balls. Do some band work. Build back up to it. But today, if somebody feels a little bit off, they're going to a chiropractor, a physical therapist, the trainer. Oh. Then they don't want to lift. And it's too much on and off. It's well, got to yeah. be... You have to, got to there, there, there has to be, you know, when we, as in, when I was dealing with the private kids, Mary took care of all my, I think we got a problem here. Look at it. I want to make sure I'm not doing something wrong. And it, it, it was fine. It, you use those resources, but you got to know how to use them. Yeah. And you got to, and you, and in private business, you've got to be willing to tell, I, I told a couple of parents, you're wasting your time. Kids, one kid had no athletic ability. I said, it's the father. I can't help him. He said, well, everybody's an athlete. I said, are you a rocket scientist? He said, no. Then, then what's the difference? Your son isn't an athlete. And another kid didn't have any work ethic. I threw his ass out. I'd kick kids out on the regular. If you don't just want remember. to work. Yeah. 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 So, you know, so you, you have to be careful who you allow in there. Because your reputation's at stake. Now, let me ask you this. Yes, and of course, course, and the people that have tolerated my ramblings, I, I, <laughs> they're going to uh, love it. <laughs> no, they're going to go, Jesus. And when I get old, I don't want to be like him. Uh, <laughs> I would appreciate yeah. if some of those people would get back to you. If they thought if I did a two hour, was available to do a two hour Zoom cast with them right. to answer their no more than 10 coaches. To answer their questions, not right. me, not me bloviating. Right. Uh, and obviously there would be a, a, a price put on it because, but I would only do them limited number. You can't. And if they would think of that would be some value. If they don't, hey, I don't want to try to do something where people aren't interested. You know, you know, there's people out there that say, Coaches you know, you're yeah, hungry to learn. You know, well, there's also coach, you know, all, every dog has its day. It's like professional athletes. you got to know when to fold them. But Kenny Rogers said no one to fold in the them, song, no to hold them. Yeah. 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 And you know, and my maybe dad used I'm, to play it on the eight track in the uh, station oh, wagon car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember when the eight, I remember when the eight tracks came out in the mid sixties, that was a hot setup. Yes. I never had it. I just had to, we just had in my 47 Ford. I just had rear speakers and boy, you know, we had rear and front speakers and with a, and a uh, kind of thing we could make one play a little more than another. And I can't remember what that was called, but that was, and then my 56, I don't think I, I don't think I had a rear speaker in my 56 Ford it was the best car ever. What kind of car are you cars. driving now, coach? I drive, uh, I drive a Toyota forerunner and, um, and my wife drives a, uh, a Lexus. Well, uh, you're in Chicago still, correct? No, no, I'm oh, in, really? I'm in, no. Uh, I'm in Cincinnati. I live on the Oasis. Oh, Gulf you're in Coast. Ohio. That's My right. grandkids are here. And, but sometimes you travel out to the West coast. Cause when we were trying to organize this, oh, that traveling. was to see family. I have a sister and a brother out there still. My sister's 88. Okay. My sister, Laura, she's a kid and she's been married 70 years. Wow. And my wow. brother Stan lives out there in Penn Valley up in the gold country. And of course, Dick lives in Pennsylvania. Where and is then, he in Pennsylvania? Uh, he lives out at Coachville, Downingtown. He has some, hundred and something acres on a conservatory he bought at the end of his eagle career I've and he built a log cabin. i've heard of down in town I, What's, his, what his, university his, would that be near do you know coach uh, all i know he's changed the address has changed at least three times you know but i remember you know there's downing town coachville and i don't know what his address is now but he lives out there and uh, and you know in fact, it should be his birthday next week. It was my brother Stan's last week. What about you? Are you on some property? What have you like? You know, I, I I live on a golf course. I live on one of the premier golf courses, and it's a it's a and it's not super expensive to join. It's very family oriented. My grandkids, two two of the three, will play a little golf, and we have a nice. They have a nice pool that they go to, yes. and they go charge. And they call me and said, uh, "Hey, can I have dinner or lunch?" And my friends, I said, "Yeah." And of course, my grandson, he loves to get the biggest thing and give them my number they love to give my charger to me and then i play so i pay so much if they want to play golf and uh i live about five minutes from when my grand and my daughter just bought a new infrared sauna very expensive big one and i was in there over yesterday and in fact the only trouble i did uh because it was wet i couldn't run tempo so i went on this uh elliptical 
and did a cardio. And then I went and got in the sauna for 35 minutes. And it's too, the sauna is just like doing tempo. And I was tired today. So I didn't lift today. I had, I know I had to, couldn't gut it out guys. And the old body said, no, you better wait till tomorrow. And then I got to get my massage tomorrow because hey, when you get one of the things to all the strength coaches, right? Anybody listening, don't stop sprinting. If you do one exercise, don't go out and pound the miles. That's the worst thing you can do for you. Just pound your joints. Now, if you haven't sprinted, start easy, gradual accelerations. And you don't have to do 10,000 yards. But what does sprinting do? Where's the movement come from your hips? You're all, you, you have to learn to absorb the ground. You have ground reaction forces. Your spine rotates. Yes. And what, what do you see when old people get? They lose their movement. Number two, squat. Even if it's just body weight to keep depth. And if you can do an overhead squat with a stick, keep doing it. Keep doing it. The other thing is go to a good PT, have them evaluate your joints. And, and, then, and then if you have a problem, go to them on a regular basis if you can afford it, or at least get some home mobility exercises. The key to staying young is strength and mobility. If you keep your joints mobile, everything else will follow. And sprinting is, you know, sprinting is the ultimate expression of the stretch stretch shortening cycle. It's the shortest ground contact time. Now, for cardiovascular, go run Charlie Francis Temple or do what we did at the Bulls. And I would even do it in the bike or treadmill here. Throw the medicine ball 10 or 20 times off the wall. Stride down the basketball court at a comfortable pace. Throw another 20. Do a set of 10 of those. Rest three minutes and repeat. We would work up to about four sets or five sets with the bulls. So what'd you do? Lateral med. So it was the Charlie oh, Francis no. med ball complex. No, no, no. I have his old yeah. man. No, no, it's just, it's just when any med ball throw you through off the yes. line, and they weren't throwing full speed. They weren't for power, just conditioning. Right. And now you can, if, if you have a basement, you can do it a bike or your treadmill or an elliptical. Now the balls that don't bounce, it's hard to do 20 because you got to put too much force. Right. So maybe you cut it to 10, but it's, it's just a moderate exercise and tempo you won't but to go out and and just run five miles i i said if you're going to run run on grass because yes. those pavements are going to come up on you when you get to be 40 and 50 yes. and if you want to run another good one is to run diagonals you run from one corner of the end zone to the corner of the goal line and then you walk across the goal line across the field 53 and a third yards or whatever it is, and then run to the corner of the other end zone, walk across, and you could do those and maybe four to six, maybe four, four, four reps, rest, walk 150, maybe work up to three sets of those, four sets, that's somewhere solid. between six. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, people think you need to do, you know, all these miles. And in fact, uh, there's a guy that I got to meet, another smart guy I got to meet, but with Dr. Greg Rose out at, Titleist performance. I would advise you to take their level one evaluation just to learn how to evaluate. Dr. What's it called? Pi. What performance? Titleist? TPI. OT. Titleist Performance Institute. Dr. Greg Rose and uh, Dave Phillips started it. And there was a speaker there named uh, Smith, Mark Smith. And they said the research, if you go hard for one minute, and rest four minutes and do six reps of that two to three times a week is all the cardio you've got to do. The intensity is more important. But you could, but I would not advise people to go out and do all that distance. And the other thing is I'd never advise people to run marathons or triathlons. What, there is some the volume. volume uh, too much well, volume. there's some evidence. Well, too much volume. So there's some evidence I've read. And I don't know if it's been proven. I've seen it different places that it can lead to maybe heart problems and other problems, anything done into extreme. Now think of the marathon. Where did, where did we get the marathon from? Some guy, some Greek ran all the way to the, what, to the city of marathon and told him the Persians were coming and he dropped dead. So you got to copy right. that. Oh, that's a, well, that's a great workout program. How'd it work? Oh, it worked. The guy dropped dead. So I will, no, I'm going to get all the marathoners pissed at me. That well, is people not I think are, You've kind well, of fallen in love. They're, yes. 
They're obsessive people. They need find something better that is really hard in your body. Yeah, I football. Mean, everybody, everybody hard talks about. I think you know football, any wrestling, exercise. lacrosse, all of these things. Any, yeah, football is hard in your body, but football, there's a, wrestling, there's some lacrosse. purpose to it. I mean, just to go out there. And, I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you. You're you know you you're you a true power up. athlete, coach. You're <laughs> you're not. Oh, yeah, I got you're, you don't well, want I to just, be running for this. No, it, it's just, I did a lot of that stuff, and I regret I did it. Well, well, I also I, I tell people if you're going to run, don't run more than 30 minutes three times a week, and do it on this. Go out in a park, go out someplace, go someplace where it's if you have to do it where the the impact isn't going Softer to hit impact. you. <clears throat> so yeah. funny that you said what you you used to run like that. I ran distance as a wrestler, and I always explain to the athletes: wrestling practice is conditioning. Then I went home and did more conditioning, and I just got weaker. So what do we have our kids do? Cleans, carries, jumping. You know, I well, have you know, a book. And uh, you know, it's filling. interesting. You talk about you talk about carries. I worked for my dad when I started working. His toolbox had to weigh at least eighty. I, I got one of them here, eighty to ninety pounds. I could barely pick it up. Then through the years of lifting, I just walk around. We'd pick it out, walk 10, 20 yards with it. We're walking with it all the time. Or if we went out on a service call because he had AAA, we'd take. So we were we were doing carries and never knew yes. it. In fact, I got strong enough where I didn't need to take a jack to put automatic transmissions in out. My brother Stan and I would take them out, take them off, and then we put the new one in. We'd put it up, bench pressing in and put it in. Man strength. <laughs> I, you know, the, well, a lot of stuff. What I hope coaches take away from this also, Coach Ramil, is kind of the stuff that you just did is also what got you strong. And it was work. It was work. And that and is then, a massive component missing well, for athletes today or in programs. These programs well, the are so thing, kind of. Well, the other thing is. We had to work in, in, in the cold. I mean, we didn't have a, the garage was an old hay barn. It converted to a garage in 1939 because the guy he was working for closed his shop and he went to and he went to gold find gold in Alaska. And now you got three kids in the mill and the depression is still on. But so and then in the winter and summertime it was hot. I mean, you didn't get to, oh yeah you can take the afternoon off to go work out. No, you did it on your time. So we had no time to get in in in, in trouble. But, the, you know, when they talk about load, when I was a junior, I got up at 530, lifted six days a week. At PE, I practiced throwing the shot. I ran the 100-yard dash in 10-5, but I never practiced. That just starts. I just, I'd leave the shot put circle and go run. Now, that's on, that's on dirt. That's not on the tracks I run the day in the shoes. And then I'd practice baseball for an hour and a half, and I might come back and throw the shot. And I did that. Now, I didn't do a lot of study, and I will have to admit about that but and then i'd go to bed at 9 30 so i could get up and i did that six days a week and but i believe you know you said you benched 400 pounds you know my son's a baseball player and i told the coach i'm not doing fall ball next year it's never ending oh, yeah. but i feel like when we were kids you want to get better at baseball we rounded up the neighborhood that'll never come back well, well, and that's why we ha we are where we are well here's the other thing everybody's concerned about society, you know, the quote bullying and all that stuff. Kids used to go play. We'd go, we didn't have enough kids. So you'd play workups and you'd have maybe three guys at bat and you'd have the outfielder. And if you went out, the guy that was a catcher came up and you went to right field and unless the right fielder caught your fly and he could give it to the game and rotate or take, make you go to play right field or whoever got we play football we play basketball yeah. the kids don't have an off season now <clears throat> if the nfl the nba and the major league baseball and i'm sure and soccer all need off seasons why don't kids who have growing bodies need an off? and you know and they get burnt out can you it's imagine just, when you, you spoke about you knew one kid that had a knee surgery surgeons back in the day must have been like twiddling their thumbs not knowing they were lonely do. Today it was done for a yeah, surgeon. Like, they're doing three to four surgeries a day. It's insane. Because, because you've got to teach kids how to deliver a blow and receive a blow. You've got to be in position and you've got to lift weights and you've got to do the jumps. You've got to coach oh. the fundamentals of the game. If I would say one thing about football, the skill level is off the chart. Not a That's question. Correct. And the strategy. But the rules have allowed the strategy to grow. But 
I don't know if fundamentals is go back and look at some of the football played it from the 60s through the 90s in college and even NFL. Look at you go back and I'll go. I'm a big Bama fan. So I go back and look at those. I'm a, a big Notre Dame fan. So I'll go back. But, you know, you look at the fundamentals of the game because today they spend so much time in strategy that they miss that. And it's like I, Dick and I have talked about it. I said, how many games would you, how many, I wouldn't have lost a game if we never missed a tackle. Even if the guy made 10 yards, if we never missed a tackle, as simple as that. Well, that's not complicated enough. We got to be, it's like in coverages. We used to play teams. We played a scrimmage, a team that did all that moving around. I said, look, now they weren't as sophisticated as today. So I'm not saying my defense was the answer. I said, we're going to, I said, it's more important that you know where to line up than they know where to line up. I said, we're going to play this coverage that's got some weaknesses, but you know what you have to do. So the problem is you got all these guys running around. Sometimes you confuse yourself in defense. And I know it's today with all those guys going out is very difficult for defense. It's funny that you say this because my buddy's a coach and he's like, I think the kids are too confused out there. Let's give them five plays and cut it and just well, focus. Well, if I was playing defense today, I'd play cover two man, cover two zone, three deep zone. And you probably have to play occasionally – you know, where you play man to man with the pre safety. The problem is when they get you in the, those motions and stuff. And the problem today with that quick screen stuff and the way they can block it, Jesus, it's, all, it's, it's almost an automatic five yards every time they run it because the first thing the guy does is get you here. And it, it's very tough, tough. I mean, the offensive coaches, have, the game has been made offensive friendly. They can spike the ball, which should be taken out. The defense can't. You can't really hit the quarterback. You can't hit the receivers. Correct. Uh, the offensive linemen are holding. I just call it what it is. It's a wrestling match. So, you know, you couldn't do that. You couldn't do those things in offense if you had to block this way. It just couldn't happen. I've got an old college game, and it looks like 100 years old. But you just couldn't do that. And we played BYU that ran the double wing man in motion stuff, but not as sophisticated as today. I mean, and any other thing, the kids are all catching the ball and the quarterbacks, you know, so much. It's like everything. It's it's like golfers hitting the ball long. They've really done a great job. The gloves have helped too. I'd like to see them take the gloves off. In football, no gloves. No gloves. The receivers. Yeah. No Even gloves. Linemen are wearing gloves. If you're if it's if it's for a protective injury but no gloves, those gloves, you know, they don't let you have stick them, but those things, no. yeah, you know, it, because they made it so offensive oriented. Jesus. If you look at the quarterback, they throw a penalty. You, you know what? Um, I'm not a, I'm not a football guy. Like I grew up wrestling coach, but now that I'm at this high school, I'm on the sidelines watching the football games. I love watching athletes compete. So I get to watch girls soccer which is some boxing mixed with some rugby yeah. and so it's very physical yeah. and it, it teaches you how to, what you need to do, but coach it's late. <laughs> let's, let's yeah. shut it down. I'm well, going to, first of all, I'm going like, to, I'd some like data. some of your, yes. if any of your listeners would be kind enough to respond about the zoom. Yeah, I'm going to collect second some of, data on that. Yeah, second of all, I apologize because I ramble. If I That's do a okay. Zoom cast, I, if I do Zoom for anybody, I'll stick to the question. But uh, I ramble <laughs> on, and I'm going to go upstairs, and my wife's going to say, "God, do you talk a lot?" And, <laughs> my uh, wife um, is going to say the same. But we got a lot of great points here, and I hope that the coaches listening, a big message here is: get athletic. Don't have high standard. Don't be afraid to build tough. Athletes. One other story no. I want to give. Yes. When we were going four, four days, the first time we did it, <clears> the <throat> kids walked on the field the third day. And I had a great assistant coach who has since passed away. He was a great high school coach in his own. He had left this high school for some reason. Not He worked there, but didn't coach for a company, coach for me. And the kids were coming on the field. He said, look how they're moving. I said, yeah, they're putting one foot in front of the other. Look how stiff they are. If we practice, we're going to get hurt. We took their pads off just hit the sleds, went through basic things like that. The rest of the three practices were fine, had no injuries. But that was I heard you coaching share the story. But that was his coaching eye I didn't have. Yes. Because he was older. So what I'm saying is I learned 
from him. I didn't say, no, we're going to do it come hell or high water. Correct. You so, got to have that coach's eye gives you flexibility. You know when to pull back. But it, you know takes, when to... it, it takes time. And, you, and the more athletes you coach, the better you'll get. Hopefully, You have to be willing to learn. And I'm putting this, I'm saying this, that I meet a lot of coaches who are not willing to travel. They only want to learn through YouTube. You have to train, you know, you yeah, have to lift, you have to expose yourself. Here's another thing. What a guy says on YouTube, go watch and see if you can coach it. Correct. You know, it's like, I'll finish with all the speed stuff. I knew guys years ago that weren't doing anything with speed. And now they're, everybody's a speed genius, you know, and in velocity, if you don't, you know, and it's important, don't get me wrong, but everything all of a sudden, you know, it, 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 conditioning, strength and conditioning and performance enhancement is like any, everything. It goes in cycles. Everything goes in cycles. Well, now software is going to be, oh. if you're going to a college, a friend of mine, I heard him <clears throat> on a podcast. He said, if you're, you're going to get interviewed, they're going to ask you about software, how you collect the data and what you do with that. For me, I can see, let's say we hook up a Tendo unit and you do cleans and it keeps, it's faster. But if it looks like shit, somebody who doesn't have the coach's eye here's the, is going to worry the about with, the velocity. Here's the problem with, here's the, all the problem with that Nintendo. You start trying to, to you're trying to beat, you're trying to make the Nintendo get better. Mm -hmm. And when the kids will focus so much, no different speed. I want you to run as fast as you can. Most kids don't run efficiently that way. And it'll be the same on lifting. You don't need all that. You know, it's, I guess all that stuff is good. You know what I did when I was the 49ers? I had a kid sit in the stands and he timed each play. I knew how long it took and how what the rest period was. Each play lasted about five seconds. And the time, and then when I was with the Bulls, I went on a, the old video and did the same thing. The ball traveled down the court. It took about five seconds, if I remember correctly. And the ball was in play about 40 before there was a break, if I can remember something to that. But I think it's all good. But it doesn't human. Uh, I talked to a great baseball manager, a friend of mine, and we were talking about all this stuff today. He said, the problem, it takes the game away from the manager. That computer and that analytics can't have a feel of the game. I went to a, I went to a Red Sox game, the Red Sox, Reds game, Cincinnati Reds game. And a batter came up, good hitter, and there was no one between – third base and almost second they'd all really want the other side i said all the guy's got to do is bunt he's got a double every time or triple you know just hit it and i i talked to someone who played for the reds a long time ago, george foster he said they don't teach that anymore i said why well then i talked to someone that knows analytics well anal the analytics say you're better to go for the home run i said okay we're playing football and there's no one outside your 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 tight end everybody's on the other side you're not going to run there what your analytics say? Common sense. And, and Dick told me there was a game. He he knew the story. They were on their own 43 to 45. It was fourth down and two or say, or one. The analytics said, oh, this, this is, you know, statistics say you should go for it. Well, they didn't get it. And that team came back and then closed. The game became much closer than it had to be. Analytics are fine, but you cannot. That computer cannot do what the human mind can do. It can't feel what's you going also, on. Also can't see for example i was uh at a place and the coach was like entering so much stuff in the computer he couldn't pick his head up and look is my athlete hustling is he you know because he's too busy inputting crap with all the wearables and there's a big disconnect so let's <laughs> you if you can't if you haven't coached long enough to figure some of that out it, yeah, like it can tell you uh, mm -hmm. how much running they're doing and all that stuff. That's all, that's all great information, but don't let the, don't, don't let it take away from the human element. There's you a know, big, that's a missing well, component. You know, when, I, I just, when I, when I was a young man in the fifties, they were all afraid of robots taking over. Well, the thing we're talking on there, that chip has taken over hundred percent. And you've got to be artificial intelligence and all that. All that, all that's great, but I'll still go with what you. Hey, I know I won't get into them, but I'm dealing with a company now, and they're such geniuses. 
you, but you, when you put your password in, they won't put a thing in so you can see what it's typing like everybody. It's a major company. And then, and then they call me back and on my phone, I have a thing. If you ever call, you have to press eight to prove you're not a telemarketer. Well, we can't do that. I said, you're a world-class software. You sell all these devices and you guys can't recognize that you need to have someone press eight. Yeah. I, you know what I tell them? Read about Henry Ford. He changed the world and more. And if you read, but all he did was more than that. Did not more than automobiles. When Kaiser went to build the ships for World War II, he was supposed to master. He couldn't do it. He went to Henry Ford and found out. You know who I believe Toyota or Honda went to? They were not doing good. They went to Ford Motor Company. Ford didn't think they were a threat. You know who built those B-24s on the assembly line? In 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 Michigan, Henry Ford. Ford did he built he it, it, what they don't have is practical common sense. You know, it's like they change their software and then you don't want to update to the new software because it never works. You know, you, you're the guinea pig. Yeah, and then you, you have, or, or you try to call them and you get like today, I was trying to call and you get all that automation. Jesus, I want to talk to a human being. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's I think people range. want that. You know, coach, that's I know you're time. saying, oh, I'm old. That's why people want to connect with humans. You know, even the art of coaching, it's the connection. So it's I'm going to collect yeah. building trust with your players and then knowing what you're doing and yeah. only coach what you know, learn what you don't learn, get out and learn, coach what you know. Yes. Learn what you don't. I'm going to, it's what you, and here's the other thing. It's what you think, you know, oh, yeah. but don't know that gets you in trouble. I've had that problem myself. Yeah. Good night, people. And I'm, I apologize. And I hope you got something out of this. <laughs> and they, you'll probably be throwing darts at this. No, no. Hold on one second, coach. I'm going to just end the recording.